All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. Hope you all are doing well tonight. Getting a little bit of an early start because we actually have a lot that I want to cover tonight. So hopefully all goes well. Um, so uh, as you saw from the title, we are going to be implementing PBR tonight, uh, at least in part. I don't know if we'll get all the way through it. Probably not. But we're going to at least start it, get a branch going. Um, I've already got a head start on it. Um, and so we're going to go over that. And uh, yeah, that's kind of just what's on the rest roster tonight, right? That's kind of a big, a big deal. So PBR is going to be done in uh, a few different parts, and that's what we're going to be jumping into tonight. And as you can see here, I've already got some uh, some logic here up on the screen, um, where I've already done a significant amount of work on it uh, since the uh, the last time we were live. We were off last week, and so I was able to use a little bit of that time to uh, to go ahead and, and get started on this. So. Uh, all right, so um, with that, I do want to take a quick second and thank the supporters of the channel. Uh, they are uh, the folks over on YouTube memberships as well as uh, Patreon and uh, our Twitch memberships. So I'd like to start with our partners who are the highest tier of subscription over on Patreon and YouTube memberships. They are Aerosleya and Gerbolis Inc. All the other folks here are the other tiers of subscription over on Patreon, YouTube memberships, and Twitch subscriptions. So thank you guys all very much. It is greatly appreciated. So um, with that said, uh, this is designed to be an interactive stream. So we are simulcasting both to YouTube and Twitch at once. So if you guys have any questions, comments, want to pipe in and, and say something, feel free to jump into chat. I am watching both of them. And uh, if you guys... Uh, have anything that you want to discuss as long as it's kind of related to what we're talking about here uh, feel free to bring that up as well so like i said this is designed to be an interactive stream so feel free to jump in tamon hello and welcome how are you doing we uh we are coming back after a week off so we have a lot of ground to cover because i did get some stuff written uh sort of off screen here so um i am going to real quick Investigates. I don't think my my chat bot on on YouTube is working. Uh, let me see. I'll try a command here. Now, so it doesn't look like it's working for some reason. Oh, yep, there it goes. Okay, I guess it was kind of half asleep. All right, uh, from Lake. How's it going? Welcome. Good to see you on the stream. I know uh, we talk quite a bit through the comments on YouTube, so it's good to have you here. Welcome. Damn it, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, couldn't actually wait to get back to it tonight. So, um, yeah, awesome. Glad to have you guys here. Okay, so PBR. Before I jump into the code that we have here on uh, the screen, I want to talk a little bit about what PBR is. So PBR is physically based rendering, right? And what that basically means is that we, instead of using uh, sort of tricks and hacks to kind of approximate lighting, uh, we try to get a better approxima approximation of lighting using uh, properties that are similar to materials in the real world. So uh, with the Fong model, which is what we've had up till now, uh, we've had uh, basically three different types of textures that we use. We have uh, our diffuse, our uh, normal map, and our specular map. And our specular map is sort of what is responsible for creating the shininess of a material. And uh, our normal map creates the bumpiness, and then our diffuse map creates the color. And uh, the difference between that and PBR is PBR actually has a lot more properties that go into it. So we're going to kind of briefly talk about uh, some of those things and what those different properties are. Um, let me go ahead and bring up my handy utility here for drawing. Uh, let me go to this. Okay. So, um, you know what, I probably should have grabbed my tablet. What did I do with it? Uh, 
I don't know what I did with that. I guess I'll just use the mouse. So, um, basically, uh, with Fong, well, maybe I should grab the tablet. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah, I just realized how bad it's going to look if I draw this whole thing with the mouse. Uh, that's definitely not going to look that great. So, try the tablet instead. Uh, do you plan on using physical units as well? So, uh, when you say physical units, what do you mean by that? M units of measurement or units... You'll have to... Lux Lumens. Um... Maybe at some point. Initially, no. Um, and so I'm going to kind of touch on uh, the various properties that we're going to use. This is mostly going to focus on the properties of materials, right? So um, when we're talking about Fong, actually, that might be a little bit small. Let me, let me scale this up a little bit. Okay. So when I'm talking about Fong, Sorry about my terrible handwriting here, right? We have three things, as I mentioned before, right? We have diffuse, which is where our color comes from. Then we have uh, normal, which is where our, we'll say bumpiness, comes from, right? And I'll just put that in kind of quotes. And then we have um, our specular. Oops. Right? And uh, this is basically our, think of it as shininess, right? And when we talk PBR, we actually have five properties, right? So we'll just kind of illustrate out what those properties are. And these are properties of an, of an individual material, right? So um, when you're thinking of this, uh, you know, like what is the color of the material? Uh, how bumpy is that particular material, right? Like um, a wood surface is gonna be a lot smoother, smoother than concrete, for example, or, uh, or pebbles, right? Uh, and then specular is how shiny is that thing, right? And so this is kind of the traditional uh, rendering pipeline that's always been used, right? And this is kind of the newfangled uh, direction that everything's going. This is kind of the best model that we have um, to date going forward, right? And there's different ways of doing this and we're gonna tackle one of those ways. So uh, the various properties here are something known as albedo right? And albedo is basically a direct mapping almost to diffuse, right? So this is where our color information comes from, right? The next thing we have is we have normal, right? And again, this is a direct mapping. This works exactly the same way, right? Sorry for my crooked lines here. But then we have... Uh, metallic, right? And we also have roughness. Wow, let me spread that out a bit. Rough, roughness, right? And finally, we have ambient occlusion or AO, right? And so what happens is this 
specular goes away, right? We don't we don't want or need that anymore. That was essentially an old school hack. And what replaces specular is these two things, essentially, right? And so uh, these two properties are a bit at odds, right? Because generally speaking, for most materials, um, you have smoothness or roughness, and then you also have metallic or more plasticky looking, right? And so metallic surfaces tend to be very shiny, very reflective, right? If the roughness is very low on that, it's going to be extremely reflective. It's going to be like a mirror-like surface, right? Whereas if you have something that's got a high roughness and low metallic property, then you're probably not going to reflect much at all, right? It's just the lighting is just going to sort of diffuse, right? And so uh, the reason for that is, is because of the way that light works, right? So if you consider, um, if you look at uh, a surface microscopically, right? Let's say we have, can I draw a straight line? Let me just cheat here and draw a straight line. Okay, so let's say we have a perfectly smooth surface, right? Plastic or dielectric, exactly, yep. Um, and so uh, basically, let's say we have this uh, super smooth surface, right? And we have, um, we have a light, right, up here somewhere, right? And that light is coming down directly under the surface, right? This very smooth surface is going to bounce light off in different directions, right? And depending on where we're looking, I'll draw a very poor looking eye here, right? So depending on where we are looking from, our looking angle, right? We're going to see a reflection of that. And the reflection that we see is directly based on um, how smooth this surface is. So if this surface is very smooth, we're going to get lots of very tight lines going back up to our eye, right? And so what that means is basically that we're gonna have a very shiny surface, right? Um, and it's going to be a very uh, close together, close knit, um, shiny uh, little highlight on there, right? Whereas if we have a surface that looks more like this, right? That's all more jagged with a light, right? What's actually going to happen is the light is going to hit these things. And because of the angle that it hits at, it's gonna bounce into or around, right? And so, um, you know, light's gonna go like this. It might go up off that way. Um, in some cases, if you have a, um, a dielectric or a, a plasticky surface, some of that light's going to be absorbed into the surface, right? And not bounce back at all, right? So if this is a, um, a very metallic surface, it's going to basically reflect almost everything versus a rough non-metallic um, surface is going to absorb more light, right? And so the difference with this is, is your light tends to be more diffused in this situation, right? So your eye, that's here. Again, this is kind of a crappy drawing here, but your eye is looking at it from this angle and only a few of these things are maybe going this way, right? And some of them might be going off this way. And so you're not going to have as much of a, of a reflection, um, you know, in close quarters here, like you would with this guy over here, but you'll see a broader, more faded out sort of highlight there, right? It won't be as strong, but it'll be, it'll be, um, it'll take up more area on the surface, right? So I hope that makes sense. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're basically going to uh, implement this system. And the cool thing about this is, is we can actually already use the lights that we have in place. So we don't have to rewrite that. Um, we can use the models that we have in place, all the vertex data we have in place. None of that stuff needs to change. Um, so like our terrain stuff doesn't need to change. Most of this work is gonna be in shaders, particularly the fragment shader, right? Kohi is supposed to use metallic roughness. How about specular glossiness? Um, I mean, 
technically you can go either route with this, right? I am choosing metallic roughness in this case, just because I find that to be a little bit, it, it makes sense more in my mind and that's what I prefer. Um, but for a specular glossiness workflow, uh, we could very easily change that um, and just rewrite the shader essentially to handle those things, right? Um, really, it's just how these inputs are treated. You basically are just gonna replace these two guys, right? So um, if you're talking specular and glossiness, glossiness is really just the opposite of roughness, for example, right? So you would basically just do one minus roughness and you have glossiness, right? Um, and then specular is essentially metallic, right? So that's kind of how those would fit in. So it's not a huge change. Um, you, I don't, I mean, I guess you could rewrite, you probably wouldn't want to rewrite the shader for that. You'd probably want to rewrite the front end and how it feeds that information to the shader, if that makes sense. Um, let's see, how does Kobe, how does PBR fit in with stylized art, like low poly games, etc.? So, um, it fits very well with that. Um, PBR looks pretty good with just about anything, right? So when you're thinking of like uh, super stylized low poly games, most of those tend to have a sort of like plasticky kind of non-shiny surface on most of the things, right? Um, and so this workflow still works for that just fine. It, it, won't, um, it won't be any better or worse than Fong. In fact, I think it'll actually look better because you'll get a little bit more accurate lighting, right? When we get to some more advanced topics on this, like image-based lighting and stuff, where we're actually sampling the scene, um, you'll actually be able to have a little bit more accurate lighting. So I think it'll fit in very well. Uh, let's see. Over on the YouTube side, love your videos, man. Really helped me understand Vulcan. Keep it up. Thank you for that. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, let's see. Maybe off topic, but does PBR still use specular for wet textures? How does that work? So uh, specular is sort of a generated property from um, metallic, based on metallic and roughness, right? In kind of the manner that I've described, right? So specular by itself is not a map anymore. It doesn't really work that way. Um, and what you would do is you would basically just play with these properties here. So um, our first incantation of this is basically going incantation. I don't think that's the right word. Iteration. Uh, our first iteration of this uh, is going to use uh, maps for each one of these things. But we're also going to have uh, eventually sliders to be able to adjust the intensity of these things, right? Um, and so what those sliders will allow us to do is to tweak these uh, beyond what just the map gives us. Um, to allow for like wet surfaces. So for example, if you have, um, if your scene suddenly starts raining and you want to ramp up the wetness look on everything, right? You would probably um, tone down the roughness a little bit and maybe up, um, maybe up the metallic a little bit depending on the on the surface, right? Um, and so you might have a separate set of properties, um, you know, for for displaying rain uh, using these versus that. That's how I would approach it anyways. We'll see how it looks. All right. Casting a spell. Yes, exactly. That's that's exactly it. Incantation. I'm, uh, well, I mean, I'm casting a PBR spell, right? On Kohi. Thanks for the answer. No problem. All right. So, um, I think... I think I've kind of descri described like the overall kind of model that we're gonna use with that, right? So uh, one of the reasons I did a bunch of off offline work is because there's a bunch of drudge work associated with the changing to this model. Because if you recall, our material system only deals with Fong, which meant all of our materials were only Fong. Um, that's not the case anymore. So I'm actually going to pull up um, I'm gonna pull up that which shall not be named. And I'm gonna show you guys all the changes that we have so far, all right? So one thing that we had to do was we had to get, um, we had to get the metallic roughness and AO maps for every material, right? 
Um, and that means that we also had, had to have defaults of those things for materials that didn't define them. So for all the materials we did have, uh, at the very least, I needed a, um, a set of defaults that I could use with that. And for most of the materials that we have, roughness was, was, uh, was basically enough. And so, um, I don't think I can open this in VS code. Let me open up a couple of what, uh, some of these maps might look like. Uh, let's see. Let me just pick a good example here. Uh, let's see. What do we want here? Probably do. What's one that has metallic and roughness. Okay, we should be able to go with this one. They're Targas, so unfortunately Windows Explorer doesn't preview them for me. Okay. So I'll show you some examples of what some of these maps look like, uh, because they may or may not make sense, right? Um, so... This is the um, one of the textures from the Sponza scene, right? Um, and so this is uh, the art, the arch uh, texture. This is uh, still named Diffuse, uh, just because I didn't want to like replace the texture. But this is actually our, our albedo map, right? So it looks pretty much like it did before. There's not much change there. The other one that doesn't have any change is our normal map, right? That's pretty standard stuff. Uh, not a whole lot of difference there, right? Um, what is different? is we have this roughness map. And so what we're looking at here um, is uh, basically a white to black scale. And the whiter the image is, the more rough it's considered. Um, and then the, the darker the part of the image is, the less rough it's considered, right? And so that directly affects how much light gets scattered and absorbed versus reflected, right? And so if this was an all black image, uh, that would be it, not rough at all. Versus if it was an all white image, it would be um, very rough, right? And so uh, we have that, and then we have the metallic, which is sort of the opposite of that, right? Um, and this material doesn't really need a metallic, but I did it anyways, just to kind of illustrate the difference. So um, this particular material um, works the opposite. Um, in sort of the opposite way, right? Um, whereas, uh, you know, black is, is still less and white is, is still um, more in terms of metallicness, um, this directly affects how, um, how mirror-like a surface is and how much light it actually reflects, right? And so um, this map winds up looking the opposite of the roughness map because uh, this surface shouldn't be very metallic, right? Um, there is actually probably a better example that I could bring up um, with this. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I don't think we have... We don't have... We don't, I don't think we have an AO map for any of these. Um, we do have some for some of the terrain materials. So let me pull up another example. Um, because there was one in here. Uh, it was the curtain material. So we'll go with this one. Uh, I just gotta make sure I'm finding the right ones here. All right, um, so here's another example. This is a curtain material uh, that you probably will recognize from the Sponza scene, right? So we have this uh, fabric where we've just got regular fabric here, but then the fabric's got some shiny stuff on it. All this gold stuff is super shiny at the base here and, and all these little details are super shiny, right? So if we look at uh, the roughness of this, we can see that uh, the, the fabric area is very rough, right? It's, it's lighter in color versus the patterns are not so rough, right? These are kind of more smooth. And if we look at the metallic, it kind of lines up with that, right? So the cloth is not metallic at all, but this shiny stuff kind of is metallic, right? And so it's closer to white. Um, and then of course you have the, the normal map, which doesn't really show up too well on here, but there are details in there if you zoom in. Um, and so uh, that's another example of it. And then the last example that I'll bring up uh, was actually for 
terrains. Uh, let's see. So I'll do... I know there was one of these that had all of them. I think it was the, the crusted snow material. Yeah, so this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay, so the crusted snow, this is one of the, the terrain materials that we have. Um, this is sort of the, um, the base color or the albedo. Um, the roughness is here, right? So you can see that there's um, parts of it that are more rough than others, right? Uh, we also have the um, metallic, which this isn't a metallic surface at all, so this is black. Um, and then we have the normal map, which looks like that. And then we have the ambient occlusion map, which basically is uh, helps us to further define um, how lighting affects uh, the surface, right? So the darker it is, the less it gets affected by light, right? And so this has got sort of dips and cracks and crevices in it that we don't want to be uh, as greatly affected by light, no matter how the light goes over it, um, just because of, of the way that that uh, ambient inclusion works, right? So this gives us a little bit more control over those materials that way. So those are some examples of some maps, right? And I basically had to go through uh, for all of those materials that we have and um, remap all of that stuff. So if we take a look at uh, some of our material materials, this is what our material used to look like, right? So this was a version one material. Um, and now they're all version two and type PBR. And so we have the maps defined individually here. So we have albedo, metallic, roughness, normal, ambient occlusion, right? And any of these maps, um, if we don't use them, we can just omit them. Um, and uh, the texture system has uh, defaults of all of these that we'll kind of show here in a couple minutes, uh, what those look like uh, that'll be used instead, right? So this is just an example of something that uses all of them. Now we do have some properties down here. Um, that aren't currently used. These are kind of leftovers from uh, the old style of material. Um, so this is still a work in progress. I have to strip these things out, but for now they're kind of required to be in place because of how the shader is, right? So um, basically I had to do this for each and every material. All right, uh, let's see. Finally PBR, cool, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna need it. Uh, next would probably be the IBL. That is what's next. Yep, reflection probes. Yep, all that. That is next. Uh, and some steps to a global illumination. Or didn't you plan yet? Yeah, so um, what's what's hilarious, actually, is I have to-dos for IBL in here in the code, right? So that literally is the next step uh, after what we're going to discuss tonight. So good call there. Uh, kudos for using Affinity, by the way. Love that suite. Only wish they would do a Linux release. Yeah, that's that does kind of suck. Um, I use it whenever I'm on Windows or Mac, but uh, yeah. Unfortunately, they don't plan on supporting Linux anytime soon. Uh, to be fair, there's not much of a market share for it, right? Uh, let's see. With PBR comes the time to switch old Sponza with the new Intel one. Maybe eventually, yeah. Um, I'm not going to do that yet, only because I don't know everything that's involved in that. Um, but uh, this does highlight some issues with the current Sponza, right? So, but yes, um, I think that the new Intel one is GLTF, right? We don't have support for that yet. But once we support GLTF, I don't see any reason why we can't use that one. So yes. Higher fidelity things. Uh, we have an ad break coming soon. So um, just so that you guys are aware, we do like to pause the stream when ads come up. Uh, so that way nobody misses content, right? So uh, it's usually around a two minute pause. I like to pause the stream. Um, and that's just to keep anybody from, from missing things, right? So let me pull this back here. And I think, yeah, ad break. Okay.
So we've got about 50 seconds left on the ad break and then we'll get back to it. Got about 12 seconds left and then we're done with ads. All right, and we're back. So uh, a couple questions. Um, how did you manage to make Vim work on Windows? You can just install it, there's an installer for it. You can literally just search Vim for Windows, and there's a uh, installer with it. And then um, I'm actually using uh, something called WesTerm, um, and that's just what I use to open up Vim. It's a pretty good uh, terminal emulator. It's cross-platform, so it's Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, and then I've got a, uh, a Neo Vim configuration. I think that's the command. Yeah, so if you follow that link there in chat, um, you'll get my NeoVim configuration. I'll put that here in, in uh, Twitch as well. Uh, I think there's uh, more of a Linux market than people think. I know I would buy it on Linux out of principle alone. So would I, actually. Um, and I told them that. Because I've actually bought it for Mac and Windows. It's a great, great suite. Uh, I will also buy your game on Linux. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm always willing to support stuff like that, for sure. How are you managing GPU memory? Uh, assumed you'd use AMD's allocator, but then realized they don't provide a C interface. So we actually have um, our own allocation hooks. Um, and so uh, that's in the... I'll touch on this real quickly. So right now it's basically um, used for tracking purposes, uh, but we actually have all of the callbacks set up here, which basically just forwards to our allocator, um, our, our, uh, our dynamic allocator that we wrote to manage memory on, um, on the host side. But yeah, this, this tracks uh, all memory that's allocated um, in Vulkan. And eventually I will also be um, making this a little bit more fine grain. Um, we have tracing in here and everything, right? So if we need to trace uh, the allocator, we actually have hooks in here for that. They're disabled right now, because obviously that's slow. Um, but we do have our sort of uh, Vulcan allocator set up here with function pointers and everything. So we do have that. Uh, let's see, I've got a couple things on the activity feed here. Uh, let's see. Octobins, thank you for the follow. Cheer Wizard, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. Welcome. Uh, let's see. All right. So I think I'm all caught up there. So uh, I think the next thing I'll do is I'll just kind of step through uh, some of the things that we have uh we've changed, right? So I updated the change log. This actually needs a couple more things added to it, but added physically based rendering. You'll notice this is going to be 0.5, right? Because this is kind of a big update, right? So when this goes in, uh, this is going to be 0.5 of the engine. Also fix an issue with pulling the default text, uh, checkerboard texture when already using a default texture. So like one of the um, default normal map or specular map or one of those, um, it was actually... There was a section of code that was actually pulling the default checkerboard um, texture, even though we were already using one of these other defaults and it was causing weirdness in the renderer for things that weren't defined uh, in materials. So I found that and fixed that as well. 
Um, I'm not going to go through all these materials, and that is the bulk of these changes, right? Because um, we see here we have 116 files changed, but most of that is material stuff. Um, so uh, I think we'll touch on the shaders in just a minute. Um, see, like most of this is textures and stuff. Um, so all the code is actually down here, right? So there were um, a number of changes that we had to make. Um, maybe I actually will start with the, the shaders because that might actually make this whole thing make a little bit more sense. So let me go with, uh, should be, why are these not sorted? You would think that you would think they would want to sort this by, I guess maybe they're sorted by folder. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it looks like they're sorted by folder. That's kind of annoying. All right. Shaders. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the PBR um, shader, right? So we have uh, the PBR shader is actually identical. Um, the vertex shader is identical to the one that we use for Fung right now. So nothing with this has changed. Um, in fact, I could just use that other file if I wanted to, uh, but I chose not to just to kind of keep it unique. Um, but the vertex shader is actually 100% the same. Um, the shader config, incidentally, uh, is quite a bit different. So um, this is our shader config file. Uh, this is what sets up all of our attributes and our uniforms um, and tells our renderer what's what, right? And so all of this goes to the front end. The front end sets this stuff up um, and then passes it on to the back end, right? Uh, and this is actually a little harder to see in this view, so let me pull this up in Vim. Um, PBR. Shader config. I'm going to close this guy actually. So um, the name of the of of uh, the shader is shader.pbr material, right? Uh, we do still use vertex and fragment. So the uh, vertex is this guy. The fragment is this guy. Um, we have depth and write testing, um, or depth testing and depth writing rather. Our attributes are the same, nothing's changed there. Um, our scopes have all remained the same, nothing has changed there. Um, the thing that has changed the most is our samplers. So um, what we're doing, at least for now, and this is a very temporary change, um, is we are treating each one of these things uh, as a separate texture. And that just makes it a lot easier while we're still building this system um, to uh, to sort of debug and figure out what's going on. What we're eventually going to do is we're actually going to probably combine these three into one texture and then just use separate channels, right? Um, and that'll knock down the number of textures we have, the number of samplers, etc. cetera. Um, but for right now, I've got them in there as all separate textures, right? Um, which again, eats more memory, but I'm not really as worried about that um, at the moment while we're still building this. Um, I also do have a placeholder in here for IBL. We're eventually going to need a, a cube texture for that, but I'm not going to go into that now because we don't have it in there yet. Um, other than that, everything else is, is the same as our Fong model, right? So really the, the, the biggest part of the change is the maps that we use, right? So uh, that is that. Now, um, the fragment shader, which actually I'm going to pull up here as well. Um... This guy is where obviously most of the details are. And I think it makes sense to look at this first because then we'll have an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing over on the code side to support the changes that we've made here. Uh, let me see, looks like I've got a couple questions. Are you using forward plus rendering or any tile-based technique for rendering? Not yet, no. Uh, that is on the roster. Um, I wanted to get PBR in first. Um, and then I probably am going to do forward, rend forward plus rendering not too long from now. Um, I have to just figure out how I want to do it. But yeah, that is basically what I want to do is I want to support both, right? So right now we're just doing forward rendering. Um, eventually I'm going to have deferred and forward plus pipelines available. Um, and those are all going to be configured uh, via our render graph, 
right? And the different passes for that. And that's how we're going to handle that. So when we go to support that, we're not going to have to do a whole lot of backend renderer work. Um, it's mostly going to be configuring the front end. Um, obviously, the, the, the things that we're missing, like right now we don't have compute. Um, so obviously, we'd need that for forward plus um, and the tile-based techniques and all that stuff. Um, so we'd have to add that. But based off of the other stuff that we've already got in our rendering backend, that's not going to be a huge deal. But that is um, that is on, in the plans, yes. Uh, let's see. Hello, I'm sorry to ask, but what does PBR mean? Uh, yeah, physics-based, uh, not physics, uh, physically-based rendering, right? So it basically means um, that we are going to be rendering our objects based off of physical properties of the material surface, right? Um, those physical properties being um, color, um, bumpiness essentially, uh, how metallic it is, how rough it is, and some ambient occlusion, right? Those are the maps that we're gonna be using, right? So uh, we're gonna kind of discuss on a high level how this stuff works. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of the theory on this because there's plenty of content out there um, that could probably explain it way better than I do. Um, we're going to sort of gloss over that and hit the highlights, right? Um, just because I do actually wanna finish up this implementation at some point, right? Um, and so uh, let's, I guess, go ahead and jump into that. So um, the directional light and point lights are represented the same way they were in the old shader, right? So nothing there has changed. Um, and again, this is uh, designed for a forward, um, forward rendering pipeline. So this shader would obviously be different um, in a forward plus renderer or deferred renderer, right? Um, and then we have this thing here called PBR properties. Uh, this is temporary. This is going to be um, eventually where like those slider values I was talking about are gonna live. Uh, those are gonna go here. Um, but for right now, we've basically got some properties in here we're not even bothering to use at all. But again, um, I needed this structure in place. So I just kind of copied that over from the Fong model for now. And I will uh, refactor that when we get to it, right? Um, okay. So we have our instance uniform object. Uh, this has all the same stuff in it before. Um, this is where our directional light is, uh, our point lights, um, our, uh, our individual properties that's here, um, and then the number of lights, right? Uh, let's see. Your videos are pretty dang neat. I appreciate that, thank you. A lot of work has gone into them, so I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, here's our sampler list, right? So um, we've just sort of defined some constants for each one of those things. Um, and the reason that we have those is because those are indexes into this array, right? Uh, this one actually... So this array has in this order, and you'll see this order over and over again, albedo, then normal, then metallic, then roughness, then AO, right? So that's the way those are fed in there. It's no accident that these are that in that order. And so these are used so that we don't have to memorize these indices. We can just use these as the index, right? So we have uh, our array of samplers there. Um, all of this stuff has, none of it's changed here, right? We've got some four declarations and a, a small function here that we'll get to in a second. And then we've got our main function. So our main function, uh, this is all the same as before. We're basically just taking our normal tangent and by tangent and creating a TBN matrix to transform um, our, our geometries matrix and combine that with the normal map. That's what that's used for. Um, and then uh, here is where we actually update the normal to use the normal map as well, right? So we just kind of combine those there. Um, the albedo, uh, we take a sample, right? So we have this an index into the samplers uh, array of the samp albedo, right? So that's that index zero up here, right? And then um, we go ahead and we um, we take that. And then we're also providing, um, we're taking the power um, of this. We're basically saying, raise this to the 2.2 power. And we'll, that'll come into play later on. We are also grabbing metallic roughness and AO. And notice that uh, albedo we're grabbing as a um, as a vector four initially um, with a vector three excluding transparency or alpha. 
uh, you'll note that these each are just float values, right? So these are just a single channel. And this is one of the reasons I was saying eventually we're gonna be taking those three textures and combining them into one. Um, because they're all essentially right now using the red channel, right? And so probably what we'll do is we'll do metallic on red, roughness on green, and then AO on blue, right? Um, and the advantage to that is that we can pack those three maps into one texture, and then we don't have to uh, have so many texture samples and all that stuff going on. But again, like I said, while we're debugging this system, it's a lot easier to work this way, right? And then once we have all the formulas and stuff figured out, we can always change it over later. Do you support frustum culling? Yes, we have frustum culling in the engine right now. Uh, occlusion culling, we do not have in the engine yet, but it's on the roadmap. Um, I would like to implement this in my engine in December. Maybe you have references or guide. Thanks for streaming. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I did touch on frustum culling. I think that was in one of the videos in the YouTube series before we started streaming. Um, so if you search, if you go to my uh, channel, my YouTube channel, which I'll, I'm going to spam some socials here. Um, but if you go to my, uh, my YouTube channel and then search for frustum, the word frustum, you should be able to find it, right? Let's see. Um, it's basically a way to imitate digitally the way real world materials react to light. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly what we're doing. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a eventual optimization that we're going to be doing there. So this is kind of where we start to get into, um, the, the meat of it, right? So basically what we're, um, the entire thing that we're, we're calculating here is the overall reflectance of the material surface, right? So we start off with a base re reflectivity uh, profile, if you will, right? Um, and basically, we've got some comments in here um, that uh, says, you know, basically, we're going to start with a, a, a value of 0 0.04, um, which is not something I just made up. That's a well-known um, sort of constant um, for non-metallic dielectric surfaces, right? Um, and then if it is more metallic, um, we go ahead and take that base and mix it with the albedo and metallic, right? Um, and the purpose of that is to get a base reflectivity factor using the, um, the metallic uh, value of it or how metallic it is. And then the albedo is for what that reflective, reflective base color should be, right? So we use it there as well. So the next part of this is the same that we had in the Fong model. We have the in mode, uh, which is either zero or one. So to refresh your memory there, in mode zero is your standard rendering mode and in mode one is lighting only. So that's sort of a debug mode that we have built into the engine um, where we can take a look at what the lighting alone looks like without all of the, um, without all the color from the textures in place, right? So we'll take a look at that when we, when we run the engine, right? So, um, these are mostly treated the same, which is why they're under the same case. Um, and there's one or maybe two spots where uh, that differs, right? So the first thing we do is obviously get the view direction, which is done by taking the view position and subtracting the fragment position from that, right? So that's uh, basically our perspective on the current fragment that's being rendered from the camera, right? Um, let's see. Hi, not very on topic question, so feel free to ignore, but did you at any point consider bindless? Yeah, so bindless is something that I've considered, uh, but I've not done it yet because it's going to require a lot of changes and it's not something that's necessarily widely supported on all configurations, especially like um, some mobile stuff. So I'm not 100% sure that I want to do it, um, but I might have like optional support for it. I hope that makes sense, at least for now. Okay. So um, this first thing here is where we actually check with this mode um, as to whether or not we want to in include the albedo, right? So um, we basically don't want to include it in mode one, right? So essentially what we do is we take the color white and multiply it by the end mode, which will be zero for regular and one for lighting only. And so for lighting only, this is going to give us flat white as our albedo, right? Um, and for uh, 
for mode zero, which is standard rendering, this is going to give us flat black. Um, and the advantage there is that we then um, take uh, the albedo and we clamp it between zero and one, right? Um, and so we take um, we take this, add it to the albedo, then clamp it. So um, if we have all white, and then we add that to the albedo, obviously those values are all going to be over 1.0. So when we clamp it, it's basically going to turn the albedo white. And the reason we do it this way is to avoid an if branch, because you don't want a lot of those in your shaders, right? Um, okay, so there's some notes in here about what this is all based off of. Um, and so this is based off a pretty well-known model, uh, which is called the Cook Torrance BRDF. BRDF standing for Bidirectional Reflective Distribution Function. So I put this in here so that you guys can Google that um, and look into uh, the, the details of it, right? But it basically it uses something called the Micro Facet Model to use roughness and metallic properties of materials to produce physically accurate representations of material reflectance, which is basically what we've been saying all along, right? So it's uh, it's essentially, uh, where was it? It's essentially this stuff, right? All right. So the next thing we do is we have this overall reflectance um, and this is an accumulator essentially. So uh, we started off at zero and uh, we just build that up as we iterate through our lights. So um, the first thing that we do is uh, we calculate our directional light, right? And so we take our directional light, um, calculate a light direction, which is basically just inverted so that um, the light reflects the correct way. And then we calculate radiance based off of that. So we have a calculate directional light radiance that we pass the light to in the view direction. And it calculates this radiance value, which is basically how much the light affects the surface um, of that particular um, fragment in space, right? And then what we do is we calculate reflectance. So we pass a whole bunch of stuff to this, uh, the albedo, the normal, the view direction, the light direction, metallic, roughness, base reflectivity, and the radiance. And we take that value and we add it to our total reflectance accumulator, right? And so we just accumulate this light and we're basically just adding all these lights together um, as we progress through the scene and all the lights in the scene. We also do the same thing for point lights. Um, this one obviously is in the loop for how many point lights we have, right? And so in this case, um, we again get the light and its direction, calculate its radiance, um, which in this case uh, is needed. Uh, we need the light, the view direction, as well as the fragment position in space, right? To uh, calculate uh, that reflectivity. We get the um, we get the radiance. We calculate the uh, reflectance, which again, we pass all these same properties to. And then we accumulate that, right? And so we accumulate that through our point lights. We then add in our albedo um, and our ambient occlusion, right? So we, we get this ambient value, which right now we're scaling way, way, way down. And we're um, taking the albedo and the ambient occlusion, and we are uh, scaling them by this 0 0.03. We're doing this because this is eventually going to replace, be replaced by something called IBL, which we'll get to here in a bit. Um, but for right now, that is basically what we're dealing with, right? Then we go ahead and we generate a color by saying, take the ambient and add the total reflectance to it, right? So in the Fong model, we had an ambient color that we fed in uh, to the shader. Here, we just kind of calculate that based on this and then we add the reflectance based on that. So this is kind of where the specular comes into play, right? Um, this is sort of a generate, you can think of this as a generation or a replacement of what specular was before. We also do some HDR tone mapping and gamma correction, right? So um, just to make it look a little bit um, more accurate, right? Uh, and this will come into play much more later once we get into IBL, right? And then all we do is uh, we go ahead and we set the out color for that fragment equal to color, which is just a RGB. And we use the albedo's sample alpha, right? And the reason we do that is because all of this math that we're doing uh, here could potentially make that um, 
have an incorrect transparency. And so uh, we want to we want the albedos, uh, the albedo textures transparency to be the ultimate, uh, the ultimate deciding factor on what the transparency of this fragment should be, right? And so we take that alpha directly and we use it. Um, and then obviously mode two, we just show the normal, right? So I hope, uh, gotcha, yeah, thanks for the answer. Yep, no problem. So I hope that uh, at least on a high level makes sense. So um, calculate reflectance. <laughs> this is where probably the biggest weight um, or the, uh, you know, the meat and potatoes of it are, so to speak. So um, this reflectance value is based off the high halfway vector, which we've seen before in the Fong model, right? That's the uh, halfway between the view and the um, the light direction, right? Um, and so uh, that's kind of where where we base our reflection off of. And then we do um, basically three major steps, right? We do a normal distribution, we do a geometry function, and then we do a Fresnel-Schlick approximation for to get the Fresnel factor, right? And so. Um, we take those three steps and we combine them together. Uh, let's see, down here, right? And then this is how we generate our specular, right? And granted, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. I'll go back, right? We then um, figure out uh, our refra refraction uh, diffuse um, and then factor in the metallic to that and then combine all of that at the end to get the radiance. Now. What the heck are these other things I, I talked about up here that I kind of skipped over? So I put some comments in here um, so that it's very clear what all this stuff does, right? So the normal distribution approximates the amount of the surface's microfacets that are aligned to the halfway vector, right? This directly influenced, this is directly influenced rather by the roughness of the surface. More aligned microfacets equals shiny, less equals dull surface, less reflection. So. When we were talking about the alignment, right, or more tightly combined rays all going the same direction, that's what we were talking about, about the shininess versus this sort of rougher surface that has them bouncing all over the place, right? The uh, geometry function basically is used to calculate self-shattering on microfacets. So this is something that's predominantly on rough surfaces. Um, and so basically if you have what self shadowing means is basically if you've got, um, a light surf, a light source coming at it from one angle, I can actually draw this. Uh, let me, let's get a new one. So basically let's say that you have a surface that looks like this, right? And you've got some lights coming in this way, right? Right? This section down here is gonna be in the shadow, right? Because it's not getting hit by that stuff. So we're gonna kind of ignore that and not, um, not process more light there, right? And so you have this kind of thing all the time um, at a microscopic level on surfaces. And so you're basically not going to worry about light bounces or any of that stuff uh, within this area because it's in shadow. It's not actually. Now, obviously, if you had another light coming from over here, that was a different color, right? Or a different direction, then you would have this area, something like that would be in shadow and that wouldn't be taken into account for that round of, of uh, reflection, right? So it's obviously on a per light basis. So uh, that is what that does. And then uh, the Fresnel effect is uh, the easiest way that I can describe this one is basically the angle of which you're looking at the material has a direct effect. Oops, we have ads. We'll have to postpone that for a second.
It's only like a uh, a minute and a half break. This one. So yeah, we got about 30 seconds left on ads, and then I'll, uh, I'll answer the questions in chat. I don't want to answer them, obviously, while we're on ad break. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Got about 10 seconds left, and we'll be good to go. All right, and we're back. So the question is, I remember reading that for Doom 3, it swapped the red and alpha channels for better normal compression. Is that compression still an issue for normals now? If so, there's a thought. That is an interesting thought. Uh, I don't remember ever reading that, but I am going to look into that because I don't know. Um, compression, of course, is always a concern, right? Um, because as textures get bigger and bigger, obviously that takes more space, right? So we have to still worry about compression, which is actually something we've not actually talked about at all. Um, and at some point we're gonna have to talk about that uh, for this engine, right? We need to get that implemented as well. So um, that is something we'll probably talk about then, but I'll tell you what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm just gonna make a note of it. Um, That way I know to research it. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, anything like that, feel free to drop drop uh, knowledge on me, right? I'm never afraid of that. All right. Uh, so Fresnel, uh, we are going to talk about what Fresnel is. So Fresnel is basically... Uh, it's the reflectivity based on the angle that you're looking at the material at. And the best example I can think about uh, with this is water. So if you're looking at um, the ocean, for example, and you look straight down to your feet, saying you're standing in a little bit of water, right? Generally, generally reflectivity is pretty low there, right? You can kind of see through the water to the, the bottom of the, you know, the sand, right? You can see it pretty well. But if you look out to the distance, it generally tends to be more sky colored, right? Or close to the sky because the reflectivity is very high. That's the Fresnel effect, right? Um, so that's essentially what um, this is calculating right here, right? And so here we combine those three, three things and we calculate our specular reflection. So instead of having a specular map, we use all of these properties to do that stuff for us, right? And so um, these uh, this function here is, is uh, basically what's powering that, right? Uh, and then we have, um, finally at the end, we, we get the radiance um, to be accumulated, which is tracked by the color, right? So we accumulate the radiance and then we're done. Um, speaking of um, radiance, we get the, uh, oh, did I say radiance? That should be reflectance. Wrong term there, sorry about that. Um, so we get the reflectance, which is accumulated by the color. The radiance um, is uh, a little bit different for point lights versus uh, directional, directional light. So radiance is basically, um, for point lights, since they radiate outwards in a circle, um, this basically is how much the light is affecting uh, the current uh, fragment in space based on its distance from the light and its attenuation, right? And so uh, we get the distance between the two and we calculate our attenuation. This, for the record, is the same attenuation that we are using in our FOMP model. So um, that carries over as well. 
Um, and then we just take the RGB color and multiply it by the attenuation, and that gives us our radiance value for the point light at the current, current um, fragment position, right? So uh, that is that for the point light. For the directional light, since it's sort of everywhere, it's much simpler, right? It's literally just the light's color. That's it, right? I just wrapped it in this to make it super explicit as to what it's doing. Eventually, when we add spotlights, we'll have a similar function to this, right? Okay. So, um, that is pretty much everything with the shader, right? I've tried to comment this pretty well um, so that it's fairly obvious what's going on with it. The second half to this is we have, uh, so this is the PBR shader. This is what is going to be basically the replacement for the material shader um, that we're currently using right now. Um, and then we also have the terrain uh, shader. So the terrain shader also got an overhaul, but it's almost exactly the same as the PBR shader, right? In fact, there's a lot of overlapping um, functions that we eventually need to build in some shader includes and, and be able to have some, some maybe header files or include files with this, but I digress. Um, so the main differences here um, is our sampler array, right? So for our um, terrains right now, we have up to four materials, which means um, we have uh, five textures per material, right? Um, and so we have um, that sampler array. We also have a uh, list of sampler offsets, right? Since we're dealing with a multiple material situation here, we have to blend those things. And so we're gonna have to offset into this array, right? And so these indexes, these are the same as the indexes before, but they're gonna be multiplied by this five um, times an index, um, and then plus this will get us our offset to the array. We'll see that here in a second. Um, most everything else I think is the same. Um, like all these functions are the same. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into those at all. Uh, the main part of this that's different is um, we have uh, this sort of collection of all of the normals albedos, metallics, roughnesses, and AOs. And uh, these are essentially what is sampled in each one of these cases, right? And so we we only sample it once and um, we keep them in here in case we need them again so that we don't have to sample the texture a second time. And so uh, this is where we loop through our materials and we pull our samples for each material, right? So, um, we get a, uh, an element, which is uh, the M, which is the index into the array, or, or the number of materials, rather. The index in the array is basically material index uh, times five, right? There's five maps, so every time we're moving five textures, right? So there's uh, our albedos is here. Again, we do the same power, um, power of. Uh, 2.2 right there. We do that same calculation as we did before um, during the sample, right? So we go ahead and we pull the albedo. Uh, we do the same local um, translation as, as we did in the, other, uh, in the other shader as well. We just have one per material now, um, which we have to do this simply because of the fact that we have more than one normal map, right? Um, and then we have metallics, roughnesses, and AOs, which again is the same thing, right? So we just sample that and store it in this guy. The next thing we do is we mix all of these, right? In our old, um, our, our old version of this, we are basically doing a loop and then mixing, and that wasn't quite right. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're doing it all in one step. So we're basically taking from each one of these materials and we're multiplying it by its weight. Um, and all of these weights will add up to one, right? So we basically just blend them this way and we mix them this way. This is all mix is doing, but mix only takes two properties and we have four that, things that we need to mix. So we're mixing um, our albedos and then we are making sure to set the alpha to 1.0 because transparent terrains don't really make sense, right? Um, and then we are mixing the normals, again, using the weights, right? Um, 
this one isn't declared here because normal is already used up here, right? So um, we're just reusing that. We're getting the metallic as before. So it's just a flat float sampling the reds, roughness sampling the reds, AOs sampling the reds, right? So this will probably be RGB when we make that into one texture. And then uh, from here on out, it's pretty much exactly the same thing, right? All of this stuff is exactly the same because this is what we needed to calculate, right? So we needed to blend between those materials and get these things. Once we have these, everything else down here is exactly the same. So this is like some of this stuff could be moved to like a header where we have this once um, in one file. But for now, we don't have that support, so I've duplicated it eventually. All right, uh, so I hope this is making sense to you guys um, so far. If you have any questions, feel free to jump in. Like I said, this is designed to be interactive, so. All right, uh, so next thing, uh, let's see, where's my... So the next thing I wanna talk about is the actual code, uh, the code changes, right? Which this is not as much as it looks like as you might think. Um, in fact, this is actually some stuff I'm playing around with, so I'm not even going to go over this. Um, okay, so a lot of what is, let's see, I think a lot of what's in here is actually not needed either, because some of this stuff is experimental. So I'm not going to touch on that. We'll touch on that when we come to IBL. Um, okay, so if you recall, I made, um, I made a reference in the change log, where we fixed an issue with it uh, pulling a default checkerboard texture when we were already using a default texture. That's what this is right here. So we have this new call texture system is default texture. And we can pass it a texture, right? So we can ask the texture system, hey, is this texture already a default texture? If it is, use it. Uh, if it's not, then we go ahead and get the default texture. So that's just that fix, right? Uh, so there's that, and then I added a check here because we weren't checking this for some reason, the result of allocate memory, right? And I was actually getting failures on this because I had too much crap running on my computer and uh, I was running out of GPU memory. So um, yeah, we were actually physically running out of memory. So this was, was throwing. So I've added a check here. So that's that. Um, scene pass. Uh, so this is what draws our scene. Uh, this got some updates. Um, so we have our PBR shader that gets loaded, right? This is where we load our PBR shader. Um, so this just follows the standard loading of any other shader, right? There's not really a whole lot to explain here. This is exactly the same as it's always worked for every other shader. The difference is uh, when we are in here in our execute, right? Um, when we're going to draw our geometries, we temporarily bind the PBR shader so that we can apply globals to it, right? Um, and then we switch back to our regular shader, our material shader, and bind those globals as well, right? So we just kind of bind all the globals at once up here. Um, and then we also uh, keep track of the current material type, right? So as we're looping through these different objects with different materials, we need to keep track of what material type we're currently on so that we use the right shader. So if the material type changes from the current one, then we go ahead and we use uh, the appropriate shader, right? Either PBR um, or Fong, right? So we've got that. Um, and then we obviously update the current material. And that's all there is to this, right? It's just a, a quick way for us to be able to switch which shader we're using. Uh, let's see. Okay, so texture system. Uh, got a few updates as well. Um, so we have default metallic texture name, roughness texture name, and AO texture names. So these are the default um, texture names for those things. We have a, um, here's that new is default texture, right? So it just says, hey, is it one of our default textures that we have loaded? And then we also have um, get defaults for our, uh, our metallic texture, our roughness texture, and our AO texture. So whenever we have a material setup that doesn't have one of these things, we have a default to fall back on and can always use that, right? 
Speaking of those things, we'll very briefly look at this, right? So in our internal state, we store those handles here. Here is our default texture, right? So it literally looks at the pointer and says, is this an alias of one of these things, right? Our default texture, diffuse, normal, specular, metallic, roughness, or AO texture. Um, and if it's any of those, it returns true. Otherwise, it returns false. Here's just our getters. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, create default texture. Uh, this one, we actually, so we've actually simplified some logic here, right? Um, our old version of this was basically just repeating all of this logic for every single texture, right? All of these guys. And so I've actually split that out into a function where we take a pointer to the texture that we're creating, the pixel data, the texture dimension, which is gonna be square in this case, and the name of that texture. And we can perform all of this just in, in, in one function and severely cut down um, this create default textures um, that's done in the in the, the very beginning. Uh, the other thing is the default checkerboard texture used to be 256 by 256 pixels. It's now 16 by 16. Didn't need to be that big. Um, 16 by 16 is, is more than big enough for that. Um, and so now instead of calling all this stuff over here every single time we're creating a texture, we can just call this create default texture and pass in a few parameters and we're done, right? So that's that. Uh, that's our default uh, checkerboard texture, our default diffuse texture, which is just white, our default specular texture, which is uh, all black, our default normal texture. Um, and again, this, is, this hasn't changed either. Um, all we do is we set, uh, we leave the Z axis to 255 and we set the X and the Y to 128. Um, and that gives us basically a, uh, a normal that's pointing outwards, right? So that's our normal texture. Um, metallic, default is black, so we just create a black texture, right? That's all that is. Roughness texture, um, in this case, is 128. So it's basically just gray by default is our roughness. Um, and then our default AO texture is white, meaning uh, a white AO texture doesn't really do anything, right? And so that's our default uh, AO texture there. Um, and then we just added these to um, destroy the default textures when we shut the system down. So uh, let's see. Why don't you blend as you're pulling the textures in might result and less uh, registers used. Since you'll probably be reading this later, I was referring to the terrain shader. So, um, well, for one thing, we're gonna be dramatically reducing the number of samplers because we're gonna combine three of those things into a single texture. Um, so that's already gonna help, right? Um, blend as you're pulling the textures in. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Blend it how, like on the CPU? Because you can't, I mean, they're they're blended per fragment. So, because you have the, you have this sort of interpolation from one to the to the next, one material to the next. Because eventually you're going to be able to paint. Um, you sam you sample them all into an array, and then mix them at once. Uh, well, yeah, okay, I see what you mean. I mean, yeah, there's, you know, definitely some optimizations I need to make, for sure. Um, I kept it this way because it was easier to debug while we're still standing the system up, but I am going to be doing an optimization pass on this pretty soon, actually, um, because there are some parts of this like that that aren't very robust, right? Um, I just wanted to get it sort of up and running first, and then before we finalize the feature, we'll, we'll clamp it down. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so that's it for that. Uh, the shader system. This is kind of a hilarious bug that I ran into. Um, and it's an issue with our, our hash table, right? But we actually wound up having a collision on property names, which is super annoying. 
Um, but then I realized that the element count wasn't like a prime number, or at least kind of a prime number. So I knocked this down by one and it resolved the collision. So LOL to that. Material system. We have a new default PBR material and a getter for that. So the material system keeps all of our PBR shader uniform locations, right? And then it also, um, we made a small note here to uh, the terrain um, where we change this from three to five. This will eventually be changing about the three when we optimize it, right? Um, and then this cube texture, which is in both, uh, that's for IBL. We're not touching that yet, but that's what that's there for. Um, so there's that. Uh, here's our PBR material. Um, here's our known locations for our PBR. So this is just the, the instance of that structure. Create P default PBR material, right? This is mostly stuff that you would expect that I have to add, right? Um, so here's our PBR locations. We're just defaulting those to invalid IDs. Um, cube texture, uh, we're setting this to five times max terrain material count. This was hard coded to 12 before, um, which is bad, right? This is more accurate to what we're doing everywhere else. Uh, if we come down here a little bit, um, we go ahead and create the default PBR material. So we'll see that function here in a bit. Here's where we get all of the locations for that shader, right? With a to do for IBL. Um, here is the terrain, right? To do IBL again. Um, and here's where we actually load the samplers. So I had hard coded indices here, got rid of that, made it more dynamic, right? So uh, this is all of that. Here's the destroy for that default material. Um, and then here is where we actually, uh, let's see, when we are um, acquiring a terrain material, we had to switch all of this stuff from, um, from our Fong model to our PBR. So uh, obviously we had to adjust the number of maps. Um, get the default PBR material. Um, again, number of maps, number of maps. Here's our getter for our default PBR texture or a material rather. Um, so uh, this bit here for the apply global, um, we added in the PBR shader ID. Now I did put a note here these locations could be wrong and out of sync if the uniforms ever go out of sync between them, right? We're only getting away with these locations that happen to be the same because the shaders are all laid out the same. So we eventually do need to fix that. Um, so here is um, within apply instance, if we are dealing with the PBR shader, uh, we go ahead and we set um, all the properties for that. So we've just added this section in here Again, with the to do for IBL. So we're just setting all these properties just the same as we do um, in our other shaders, right? Another to do for IBL. Um, when we're applying local, we just make sure to use the correct shader ID and then the correct index for that. Uh, this is uh, to load a material, so loading up a PBR. Um, we basically have our to-do here for PBR properties because, again, we're still using this Fong stuff. So eventually we'll be swapping that out with those slider values and, and whatnot. Um, and then um, here's all of our maps, right? So we have albedo, normal, metallic, roughness, and AL, right? So we check to make sure each one of these things was assigned. So as we're looking through the map names, we can say, okay, well, we've, we've got this one, we've got this one, we've got this one. And then at the bottom, we check to make sure that we have all those things. Again, this violates the dry principle a lot. So I'm going to have to refactor this so that it's not quite so repetitive. Uh, and then here um, in further down in load material, right? Um, we just need to select the correct shader to load resources from. So in this case, our new shader PBR material. We have five. Um, five maps for a PBR, right? So we just need that map count there. Um, and then here's the creation of the default PBR material, right? 
So literally what this does is sets the textures in the array to the default, you know, default, uh, we're gonna use the checkerboard for the default diffuse. Um, default normal, default metallic, default roughness, default AO. We assign all those things, acquire the instance resources and we're good to go. Um, and then in this last create default terrain material, um, we go ahead and um, we set up a default map for that or default um, uh, material for that and set the default textures and load those up, right? So before it was only three channels, now it's or, uh, three textures, now it's five. That's most of it, right? Let's see. Don't be, don't mean to be annoying. Just something that stood out to me. No, it's not annoying at all. No, feel free to um to suggest stuff. You know, that's uh, part of the power of of uh, streaming this stuff and and allowing you guys to sort of look at at it with me. Is this is kind of like a code review, right? So there's going to be stuff that I miss that's right here in front of me, but I don't always see it. That you guys will pick up and go, hey, that's foobar. You should fix that. Um, and so that's. Yeah, definitely. If you see something, speak up. Ask a question. You know, don't be afraid to, to ask. It's not annoying at all, I promise. Do you like Vulcan? Most days? I have a love-hate relationship with Vulcan. <laughs> um, parts of it are needlessly complicated. And I get why it's complicated, but man. Sometimes it is super annoying. Um, but also I feel like if it weren't for Vulcan, I wouldn't have quite the understanding of how all this stuff works on the GPU side without it. So it's a double-edged sword, right? Okay. So, uh, that's that, uh, font system has an update. What did I do in here? Oh, uh, I ran into some stuff where when I recompiled my code, um, it actually picked up on some unused characters or unused uh, variables. So I removed those out of here. That's what that is. There's a couple of those changes that snuck in here as well. Uh, remove this comment because it was useless. That was solved a long time ago. Um, so in Terrain Loader, I changed the way that we are calculating the height, right? Before, what I was doing was I was basically taking the height, which was the R, G, and B, and I was just adding them together and then dividing that by 255. I don't know what I was thinking there. That's rubbish, right? That's not the way R, G, B should be com combined, right? What it should do is we should use this function that I made a while ago that takes a R, G, B set of values, 0 to 255 each, and combines them into a single 32-bit integer, which if white has this value, then we take that integer and divide it by white, right? And that gives us our height, right? So th this is much more accurate now. Uh, all right, material loader. This surprisingly did not require much change at all. So the biggest change here um, was if we have a type of PBR, we take the shader name and assign it PBR material, right? And that's done so that the correct shader is selected later on, right? Um, and then this is saying it was changed, but it doesn't look like it was. Well, it looks like it removed some sort of weird character there and replaced it with a space. Okay, whatever. So that's that. Uh, terrain, some comments. So this section, I'm not 100% sure is right yet. This is where I'm blending the material weights, right? And this is kind of a hack anyways. Um, but this is basically where describing how the, um, the material blending is working, right? Um, and so I'm not 100% happy with this. I'm probably going to be re revisiting it, but it gets me the result I need for now. We have ads.
So for those of you that can still hear me, um, not everybody gets served ads, right? But um, depending on locale and what platform you're on, you might get ads served to you, um, either on YouTube or Twitch, right? And so uh, what I like to do is whenever my timer for ads goes off, I'd like to pause the stream and uh, give folks a, uh, a chance to uh, get through those ads. And then we go ahead and resume the stream afterwards, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, it generally only takes a minute and a half to two minutes sometimes uh, total for everybody to get through those. So I just like to pause it. That way uh, nobody misses anything, you know, on screen there. Also gives me a second to get some water. Got about five seconds left and we'll be good to go. All right, and we are back. So uh, I would encourage you guys also to, um, if you haven't already, feel free to follow me here and subscribe over on YouTube um, just so that you guys don't miss future streams. And any other content I release, I release uh, YouTube shorts every day. Um, at least for right now, with uh, little tidbits of information um, that's cut out of these live streams and other videos and stuff that I've made where we have little discussions about things and sometimes something comes up that's like, hey, that would be kind of a, a cool little nugget of information or something funny happens on the stream or something like that. So feel free to follow me in both places um, so that you don't miss that stuff. I appreciate the follows. It helps me out a lot um, in trying to grow the channel. I'm trying to have this as sort of a educational resource uh, so that folks can learn how this stuff is actually built. Um, I do also like to say that my way of doing this is a way of doing it. It's not necessarily the only way of doing it or even always the right way of doing it. Sometimes we have to go sort of the wrong way about it first and fix it later to get through an explanation, right? Um, but this is designed to be an educational resource, um, and it's kind of the resource that I wish I had when I was learning how to do all this stuff, right? So if you guys like that and want to support my work, the easiest thing that you can do is to follow me in all the places, right? So I greatly appreciate that. Um, and with that, uh, let's go ahead and continue. Um, let's see, comments. Uh, also wanted to give props. I followed the development in the beginning, but then sort of fell out of the loop. Just today, I saw the stream, and I have to say the code looks awesome. Awesome. Cool. I'm glad you like it. I'll have to catch up with the project as it looks really good. Yeah, it's coming along. It's come a long way since we started, right? The project's been going um, for a couple of years now, and uh, it's going pretty good. It's, it's not too bad for something that's done by one guy in his spare time, right? Um, I, I kind of like the where we're getting, and, and once we get this PBR stuff in and all sorted, um, it's really going to start looking a lot more sharp, right? Okay, uh, so that's the terrain. Um, we have just a couple of code files here left, I think. Um, all the rest of this is actually just content. Um, so, uh, you know, assets. So I don't think we actually have to touch any of that stuff. Uh, we've already gone over the shaders. So let's get through these couple of files and then I'm gonna run it um, and we can take a look at what it looks like. So that's amazing. Corvo, I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate that. That kind of feedback helps me a lot. Um, okay, so it looks like we were just missing a void there. Um, so it was bleating about that. Uh, Kmath, uh, we have K attenuation min max. So that's what we're using to mix the, um, the terrain materials, right? Um, and then here's the implementation of that. Um, and so I'm not 100% happy with the way that we're doing this right now. And I even have a to-do in there on something that might work a little bit better. But um, for right now, that works. And then version is just our version number, right? So nothing nothing special there, although I do need to up that to 0.5. Um, so let me actually, let me go in here and just kind of knock that out real quick. Uh, let's see, that was under this, I believe. So the miner needs to be... I really should probably be reading this from a text file so I don't have to do both of these, right? But at least that's up to date now. Um, 
Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna build this real quick. Just because I changed the version number. I don't think anything else is actually needs to be built, but we'll see. Okay, uh, and let's go ahead and run. And I'll pull this down and we'll load up. So you can see those uh, default textures popping in there as we are loading things. So it's got something that we can actually render the geometry with as we're, as we're loading up. So um, we've got our Sponza scene here um, and we've got this sort of little car mesh down here with our, with our lights going back and forth, right? And so um, we can see at the moment that, you know, everything looks kind of dark, a little bit dark, you know? Um, but if we go over here, uh, the best example of our, of our terrain materials working the way they should be is this snowy texture, right? So it's super glossy, super shiny. Um, and if we get over here and catch the light just right, um, we can see that that, you know, looks pretty good. You know, it's, it's pretty high fidelity. Uh, the lighting looks pretty good on it. For not having um, IBL and uh, things like post-processing bloom, stuff like that, it's starting to look pretty good, I think, right? Um, obviously, it's not 100% yet because everything is a little bit dark. Um, you'll notice that all this is dark, and that's because we don't have the IBL in, right? Uh, once we get IBL in, that'll make a, uh, a big difference here. Um, and then the other thing uh, I want to quickly touch on. Takes a minute because the camera is not the fastest. I could probably speed that up, but then it makes it more difficult at slower speeds. So I should probably add a console command or something for that. Um, okay, so here is our are sort of test lights, right? They're a little bit hard to see um, at the moment, but uh, they are actually affecting uh, the scene. Um, and if I actually grab this car and pull it a little closer to the lights, it makes it a little more obvious, right? Um, so you can see that's being affected there. And if we take a look, uh, one of my favorite spots to look at to see the lighting updates um, is actually the back of this. And so we can really see that metallic shininess in some spots. Um, and then the dullness of other spots, right? And that wasn't really coming through as clearly with the other model, right? Um, the other thing that we can look at is uh, we have this sort of uh, glossiness off of this front bumper in some spots, right? Where we didn't really have that before. The whole thing was kind of shiny, right? And now we've got, um, you know, certain spots that, uh, like this, this wheel here, the hubcap here, um, where the chrome kind of shines through and then other spots it doesn't, right? Um, and so that's our material properties working for us, right? And so I'll come up with some better examples, but, um, you know, that is looking a lot more realistically lighted, right? Um, the other thing is, if we go in here to our Sponza scene, now we, I don't have any lights in here, but actually, actually, let me take that back. Let me go back this way. And I'm going to grab the Sponza scene itself and move it. Uh, a little bit more, I think. Actually, back a little bit. Right, about there, right? So that we can kind of see how uh, the light affects this. And we can see that uh, the light is, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of, of, of better reflectance off the surface of these bricks when we're at this angle than if we look at it straight on, right? And so, um, you know, all of the, the lighting changes that we've made, uh, I think, make this all look a lot better. You can really see some difference, too, in uh, this reflected shiny spot here where we can really see the, the different lights, you know, sort of coming together and, and making um, all of those changes. And this is, this is what uh, PBR gives to you, right? It's a lot more accurate of a lighting model. Um, and so um, if we want to see just the lighting itself, I can hit control one. And now uh, we're looking at this minus um, the albedo essentially, um, which I think the albedo is actually still taken into account when we're dealing with the uh, specular color. So we can see here, we've still got a little bit of gold in there, um, but it allows us to sort of visualize uh, how this is um, affecting the the scene without uh, the, the texture color in there, right? Um, and so you can see, you know, it's it's affecting the, the sand down here and whatnot. 
Um, and if we want to take a look at uh, some normals, I can hit Control 2. And we can see what our normals look like, right? Um, so if we needed to debug that to make sure that that's working as it should, um, we can certainly do that. And we can, just to see what this looks like, I'm going to select the car and um, and, uh, and we'll go ahead and, and uh, maybe let's see if I can, can I select a car? Because it's inside the Sponza. I don't know that I can actually select it. That might actually be a bug. So that might be something I need to fix, right? Because uh, I can't... Yeah, it's selecting the Sponza object because I'm inside of it. Okay, so I'm going to have to fix that, right? Our Raycast shouldn't be trying to detect inside of that. So let me move the Sponza out of the way. Because what I want to show you has nothing to do with the Sponza. Alright, so let me move this guy over here. Um, incidentally, our Sponza uh, isn't 100% correct either. These black surfaces here are where the normals are FUBAR, right? So eventually we're going to be replacing this model with a better version of it as well. Uh, so let's grab our car. And we can go ahead and uh, rotate him to see our normals change, right? So that we know that stuff is still working as it should, right? So that's all good. Uh, if we switch back to the lighting mode here, um, we can see it looks like all of our stuff is working as we might expect, right? So, um, that is sort of the first iteration of PBR. Um, and that's where we're at right now. Uh, let's see. It takes a lot to be consistent for such a long period, especially a solo. Very impressive. Yeah, um, I chalk that up to stubbornness, honestly. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty stubborn, and I refuse to let this project die, right? So... Um, plus it's gotten a lot of traction, um, and that tends to be a pretty motivating factor as well. So, um, just folks interacting with me here on stream, following me, um, leaving YouTube comments and interacting here and on Discord, um, Twitter, whatever it, it may be. Um, that's a very motivating thing for me. So, um, that also helps me continue, right? Cool. All right. Uh, so that kind of completes what I had on the roster for tonight. I actually did not expect to get through all of that tonight, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to... Um, I think I'm going to... I'm going to create a branch and check this in as I have it now. And then we might start taking a look at some IBL stuff. Um, or at least trying to get a um, a cube map in there, right? And we'll see how far we get with that. Uh, so I'm going to do get checkouts feature PBR. Oops. That's going to be a big ad. Yep. Okay. Uh, initial, initial commit of PBR feature. Uh, PBR. Let that upload. Uh, it's IBL, so image based lighting. Okay. 
So that's the next thing we're going to be looking at. So um, basically what image-based lighting is, uh, you'll notice that our sort of ambient color is really dark right now. And um, image-based lighting allows us to take an image, essentially, and use that as the basis for our ambient light. And so uh, what we're going to do to accomplish that, and we've seen some references in the code already, is we're going to use a cube map to do that. And that cube map is initially going to be pre-rendered, right? So we're just going to use a static cube map, which is actually going to be our sky map, right? Because that makes the most sense, I think. And we're going to take our sky map and we're going to sample out of that cube map and use that as our, um, our sort of ambient factor, right? And that's going to factor into all the light that bounces around in the scene. It's going to basically have a little bit of that sky just sort of there ambient, right? And then our lighting will be on top of that. Um, and so uh, initially speaking, we're going to use just a static cube map. And then what we're eventually going to do is we're going to have a, um, a dynamic cube map where we have what, we're, what we call a probe that sits somewhere in the scene. Um, and what that does is it basically has six cameras on it, right? One facing north, south, east, and west, one facing up, one facing down. And uh, from there, it basically grabs a snapshot of the scene for all things that you want to be rendered in your sort of cube map, right? And then uh, the result of that is been placed into a cube map texture. And that is what you actually use um, to, to actually render out your scene, right? And so I, I hope that makes sense. So those are sort of the next couple of steps that we're going to take. I don't know how far we're going to get with that tonight because I, I have a suspicion that um, adding the cube map is going to be get, get a little bit dicey, um, but we'll see. All right, so the feature is uploaded. So I think the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and get the cube map in and working and see if I can actually sample it, right? And then um, we'll go about applying it afterwards. So for a refresher on how a cube map is inter interpreted in the shader, uh, we can look at the skybox shader because we already have cube maps because our skybox is actually using it, right? Um, and so um, the cube map itself is just a normal sampler, right? So from this perspective, we don't have to add anything. From the shader's perspective, um, instead of a sampler 2D, we have a sampler cube, right? And so uh, instead of a sampler 2D, we have a sampler cube, so we need to add that. Um, and then we sample against a 3D texture coordinate, um, which is actually taken uh, from uh, the in position, which um, I think is just the camera position, right? And so there's camera position, and then I think that's it, if I recall correctly. We'll get to that when we get there, right? Um, so that is that. Skybox. So the, I guess the first thing we need to do, let's turn it on in our shaders. So uh, I'll do PBR. I'm going to do the PBR shader first. Um, let's do the shader config, actually. So this is the to-do IBL. I'm going to uncomment this guy. Right, so now we have a cube texture. So this is our our texture array here for our, our other textures, and then we have a cube texture here. Um, we are going to keep this at instance level. We don't want it to be global because we technically could have more than one reflection probe, right? Or a IBL probe, whatever we want to call it. We could technically have more than one. Um, and so I don't want to limit us to one by putting that in global scope. Okay. Um, 
so we've got that uh, PBR. Let's take the fragment shader. And we have this to do IBL here. So I'm going to uncomment this line. And this is the bit that I'm not sure is going to work. So you notice that we have the same set and the same binding here. And then I have one of these after the other. So what what I've read that you can do is because you obviously can't um, you can't do typecasting in GLSL. Um, a sampler is sort of an unknown type. And so what I've read is that you can actually alias the array as different types. So that's essentially what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm aliasing the same samplers array as cube samplers, even though the only sampler that I actually want out of this as a cube sampler is going to be the last one. So I need to change this to a six, right? And so that last one will technically be IBL uh, cube map is what I'm going to call it, right? Um, and in theory, if this works the way that I, I think it's going to work, we should be able to just use, as long as we don't overlap usage between these two, we should be fine, I think. So we're going to try it and see if that works. And if it doesn't, I'll have to go back to the drawing board. All right. Um, the other thing that we can try is just not having it be an array, like we could keep this array at five and just have this be a single thing. Actually, you know what? Let's try that first. Mm. No, I'm gonna try it this way. I'm gonna try the alias way first. And if that doesn't work, I'll, I'll figure something else out. Uh, okay, then we're going to sample it. I'm not gonna do anything with that sample for now. We're just gonna sample it. We're going to sample it uh, using a position of zero, because whatever. Why not? All uh, right. So I think that's all the change I need to make in the shader for right now for the PBR. So the next thing is going to be uh, let me wait a minute. I guess the material system. So PBR shader uniform locations. We already have one here for what we're going to call a cube texture. Let's call this IBL cube texture. Um, and then That'll also help me note all the uh, locations of this. So IBL cube texture. That should be fine. Material locations. Okay, here's the Here we are actually getting the IBL cube texture location. Um, yeah, I'm going to call this IBL cube texture, which means this should be IBL cube texture. All right. Uh, so we have that. I'm not going to do this for the terrain shader right now. I want to get this working in one place first, and then I'll do do the other. Um, okay, so we'll skip that for right now.
I think we're going to have to acquire resources for that. I believe. So let's see. Needs creation. This is, oh, this is terrain material. I don't want that. Material system acquired from config. Load material, this is what I want. All right. Material shader name. Okay, so that should give me the correct material there. This is Fong, I don't want that. PBR. So here are the maps. So this is probably where I'm going to need to add that. Yes. Okay, so this is going to have to be six. This is going to have to be six. Um, let's say B8, IBL, cube, assigned, equals false. Um, and then we're basically just going to do this section. But we don't have a default texture to assign to that. All right, so this is going to be IBL. IBL cube, I guess we can say. This is going to be maps five. And then we don't have a default cube map texture. So I guess we probably need to create one before we can do anything else, right? We should have a default cube map texture. Hello from Uzbekistan. Wow, that is a long distance away. Hello and welcome to the stream. How are you doing tonight? Hope everything's going well. We are figuring out uh, IBL at the moment, image-based lighting, and I'm just trying to figure out how to get a cube map into our shader alongside the rest of what we have in there. So I guess I need to go to my texture system and add new one of these. Right, uh, to the default cube map texture. Uh, default default cube texture, I guess we'll call it. Because cube textures are different than normal textures. Right, so let's do that. Uh, let's see, default AO texture is the last one. Oops. Get default video texture. Here we go. Oh, we have an ad break. So I'm just going to pause the stream here for um, a moment. That way, nobody misses anything. 
So it looks like this uh, ad break has got a little bit over a minute left, and then we will be back at it. Got about 40 seconds left, and then we can continue. Let's see. Just checking my Discord messages real quick to make sure I didn't miss anything. Diuman, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome to the stream. All right. We are back. All right. Uh, oh, thank you so much for the tier one subscription, Diamond. Thank you. Appreciate that. Your support is definitely appreciated. Thank you for that. And uh, definitely, um, definitely feel free to spread the word too, because I'm hoping to, to grow this channel and, um, you know, get more people on board as, as uh, engine developers, right? So, okay. Um, so, getting our default cube texture. Uh, we're basically going to do the same as this. Been watching the engine series and have been following along in C++ though. That makes sense. And this is the least I can do. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the support there. Yeah, it definitely. Um, it definitely goes a long way. And anything that's um, anything that I make on this channel goes right back into the channel. Um, so, uh, for example, I was able to port this to uh, Mac because I was able to get a Mac machine. Um, based off of uh, the income from this stream and from YouTube um, over the last couple of years. So I was able to save up for, for that and, uh, and pay for it. So, you know, it allows me to get uh, software licenses and better equipment, stuff like that. So um, I really appreciate the support. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so we need, we need a default cube texture. Um, default cube texture, and we'll say cube here, and now all I need to do is create that, which I'm actually going to have to manage that here, because we have... We have something in here already. Lobe cube textures. Texture names, and I think this actually loads the resources, which unfortunately isn't completely what we want for a default texture. Um, okay, so it looks like when we load this from file, we loop through six times load up a resource for each one of these things based off the name of the texture we passed in. And then texture. Okay, so the texture it looks like we set the width, height, channel count, flags, generation, mip levels, all that stuff. Take a copy of the name image size, set up a pixels array. I 
if not pixels. I'm trying to remember exactly how I did this. So where would pixels be? Oh, right. Okay. So we load this data into pixels. Verify all textures are the same size. Okay, so this gets done on the first iteration. This happens on all the others. Then we copy to the relevant portion of the array, the pixels. Let me clean up the res Okay, so I think we can actually get away with doing basically the same thing minus the resource stuff. So then we create the texture, free the pixels array. Okay, so what I'm actually gonna do is I'm actually going to, I'm just gonna grab a copy of this whole function actually. And create default textures, create default texture. Let's create uh, let's actually paste this here. We'll just modify this. So we'll say create default cube texture. Um, so we'll take texture T, right? Remove that from the end. Uh, we also don't need texture names. Oops. Um, and I think since this isn't a generic one like this, we're not gonna take in texture dimension or pixels. We'll generate that in here. Um, and what I'm thinking for our default cube texture, I'm trying to decide whether we should go white or whether we should do the checkerboard pattern again. I'm leaning more towards the checkerboard pattern because that'll make it super obvious what's happening when we actually go to load it up. But maybe we'll change the color of the checkerboard to like red or something. But we definitely don't want to have to load anything from disk, right? So let's take this. Oh, this is a this is a bug too, I think. Is this? I think that array is way too big because we downsized that texture dimension, but I don't think we downsized the array. Um, yeah, it should be way smaller than that. It should be 1024. Um, right, it should be this, essentially. Actually, let me do that, that's a little clearer. Um, and this is actually misleading, so let's actually get rid of that. So essentially what I wanna do is this, up here um, and we basically want to load that into each side of the cube right for now uh, text dimension channels pixel counts instead of pixels I'm gonna call this um, cube side pixels cube side side pixels um, I 
Okay. All right, so that's created on the stack, so we don't have to worry about cleaning that up. All right. Um, so in here, image resource params. I don't think I need any of this crap. Um, so width is going to be text dimension. Text dimension on heights. Channel counts is going to be four. Uh, MIP levels is going to be one. Generation is going to be zero. Flags. Do I have to? I don't think I need flags. Take a copy of the name. Yep, that makes sense. With height, channel counts. Um, and then pixels is image size times six. Yep, that should be the same. Okay. Um, I don't actually need to do this, any of this because it is going to be the same because we're generating it. Um, so instead of resource data pixels, it's going to be uh, cube side pixels. Oops. Um, and then we don't need to do this because we don't have a resource. Then we create the texture, free pixels, return true okay so uh, the only thing that I want to do on here is um, we are filling this with 255 and then zeroing out every other row and every other column um, the R and the G which is leaving B right so if I want to do this red I need to change these to twos. And that'll just give me a red checkerboard instead of a blue one. So that should do. And then all I have to do is create default cube texture, pass in the handle, give it a name, and it should be good. So I can come down here. Uh, I'm gonna copy it off of this one. cube texture default cube texture uh, we don't need any of this create default cube texture default cube ah cube texture uh, and we don't need that or that. This should be cube texture name, which we don't have. So let's add it. So now we've got that. We just check up on chat here. All right, it's getting late for me, so I'm going to head off to bed. Thanks for the stream. Hopefully I can catch another one. I had a lot of fun watching today. Well, awesome. I'm glad to have you here, and uh, it was great to see you, and welcome. And uh, I'll uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thanks for, uh, thanks for popping in. Appreciate you being here. All right. Um... So, that's our default cube texture creation. We do need to destroy it. So, default cube texture. And then we also have uh, our inquiry as if it's a default texture. We need to include that in here. 
Um, so. Default cube texture. Okay, so there's that. Um, it's already hooked into it. Okay, so now we should be able to get that wherever we need it. Um, which is exactly what I'm going to do. When we're creating our... Yeah. This is obviously not going to be how we're going to keep it. Just loading a default cube map for now. Need to get this from the probe instead, which we don't have yet. So this will work just fine. Uh, assign map really quickly. Config maps. So this is the material config, right? So this is a material map. This just has this kind of stuff on it. So we're actually going to have to use a... We're going to have to use a default um, or like a different map on this, right? Because it's not going to be part of the material config. Um, which actually means this won't even exist. Should we be able to assign that by material though? Should that exist per material? Because maybe, maybe there's a reason we'd want that. Right, like maybe each material should be able to have its own cube map for IBL. Maybe you should be able to override it. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna allow it. Yeah, I'm gonna allow that. Uh, cube, IBL cube assigned. All right, and then add another one of these. I really need to fix this too, but. Don't know why the earlier comment disappeared, but about the alpha and red channels, it was mentioned in an old 2004 article, Doom 3 Video Requirements, by Robert A. Duffy. I'm going to copy that. I don't know, YouTube like deletes comments every once in a while, so I'm not 100% sure what happened there, but I am going to write that down. So I have it. Found it when I was rabbit trailing was reading about bias universal, then S3 texture compression, then following references. Okay. Yeah, that should be a good, a good read. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I always like reading stuff like that. All right. Um, IBL keep assigned. So we want to make sure this is always assigned. So here's where we create a default map, right? Um, config name is going to be IBL cube. We want the sixth map. And this is going to use Q 
cube texture. Okay, so at least we already have one that we can always use and we can worry about overriding this later with like a global one. But at least this way, one, one will always exist by default. Um, and that makes sense to me, I think. All right, uh, do we have any other IBL stuff in here? Comments, I don't. App count for this is now six. Um, oh, that's material type custom. Okay, I'm not worried about that. So we have six here. Okay, that should all be good. Create default material. We don't need to do anything there. Create default PBR material. So we just need to add a line here. So this is gonna be map index five. And then we want cube texture. Uh, which means we need to do this uh, excess elements that's because this needs to be a six uh, ooh I almost missed this here that needs to be a six that needs to be a six I should probably get rid of these magic numbers at some point that's gonna be bite me in the ass totally Here's another one. Hmm. Let's go to the top here. Maybe I should do, where is this one? And then resource types, not where I was expecting that to be. Terrain, hmm, I guess that kind of makes sense. Because of how we actually load terrains. Let's put this PBR uniform look Let's put it right here. Uh, PBR map count six. Uh, we'll do if not defined. PBR map count and F. Uh, and I'm doing it as a define instead of a const integer because I don't want to invoke VLAs, which sometimes the compiler will do anyways. Uh, okay. So let's do PBR map count. So do it there, do it there, there, there. Uh, yeah, I was, was going to say, I thought there was more than one, one more in here. Um, okay. I know there's more than that throughout, but at least I can start replacing those as I find them. Uh, default material. This has hard coded five, but that's completely different actually. So, ooh, you know what? 
I'm going to leave that one alone for right now. I want to get this working in one spot and then I'll do it in the other. Because that's actually going to be wrong when it comes to the terrains. Um... Okay. Let me think. What else? Th what else do we need to do? So in the material system, we need to actually apply that. Um. So when we do apply instance, material shader, PBR shader, this needs to be IBL, cube texture, maps, sub five. So we can get rid of this to do. Um, This is terrain shader. Okay, I'm not doing that right now. Let me do a to do IBL. Where else do we have these? Terrain shader, I'm not going to worry about those. That's the terrain shader. That's the terrain shader. Okay, so I'm not gonna worry about that. I think we have everything we need, I believe. So let's see how, let's see if this blows up. Yeah, that's what I thought. Undeclared ident- oh. Shader syntax. PBR frag. Cube samplers. Um, yeah, we didn't define this one, did we? Let's do const int equals five. Uh, okay. And I think that second error is just fallout. So this is a shader we don't need to rebuild. Let's just rerun. Okay. We didn't get any shader compilation errors. Now let's load a scene and see how it blows up. Oh, yeah. It doesn't like that. Not surprised we buffer overflowed with all this crap being written to the logs. All right, so let's stop this and look at... Ah. I'm going to console.log. That one. Uh, let's see. So our shader loaded successfully. That's good. Here we go. Here's a few draw indexed. And it looks like they're all the same thing. Okay. So, default view. Okay, so this is looking like it's pulling default textures for something, which actually does make sense, right? That's probably what all these things are because nothing's loaded. Uh, default AO view, okay. So these are, these are likely textures that haven't loaded yet. This is something that's using the default AO map, and this is using the default cube map. So those resources, I think, are created correctly. 
Oh, we have ads. Missed that completely. I will go back and re-explain what I'm looking at here in just a second. I didn't realize ads had come up. got about 20 seconds left and then we'll be uh, on our way. All right, and we're back. Cool. So um, I was just looking at the, the logs here with all the errors, right? Um, and so we have some validation errors, uh, view type, right? So if we look at these, we can see here that uh, four of these are using a default view, which is telling me that these are textures that uh, haven't loaded yet. Um, this is the default AO view, which means that texture was, uh, or that material was using that texture by default. It was using the default AO texture and the default cube view is being used, um, which tells me that that resource is set up correctly and being referenced correctly in theory. Um, so let's see, draw indexed, descriptor set, binding index one. Yep, and see here's all the indexes, right? Zero through five. So this is all for the same material. Um, binding one index view type is Oh, well, this is rubbish. That's wrong. Oh, wait. Oh, that might actually be wrong on this one. Because isn't the view type... Isn't there a cube? View type cube. Hmm. Texture type, image view creates. So texture type, do we, don't we use Create default cube texture. Don't we actually set that? I thought we did. Did we really not set texture type? That's actually kind of shocking that that wasn't done before. I don't think that's going to solve the problem, but let's read what the rest of the issue was that it was bleating about. Um, okay, so the image view type is type 2D, but the op image has dimension or dim cube array to zero. Vulcan spec states if the view accessed as a result of this command, then the image views view type must match the dim operand of the O type image described in blah, 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 blah. Okay. So basically it's saying there's a mismatch between this being a 2D texture and it expecting a cube. But why is it expecting a cube for all of these things? That's the weird part. So I'll bet since we've set... I bet since we've set this one, if I were to relaunch now, I'll bet it eliminates the error for that one, but all the others are still foobar. Let's see. I'm going to kill this before it crashes. Maybe. Yeah, see, now there's only five errors at this point in the logs. 
So if we go over here, index zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, yeah. So that last one did disappear, which tells me that for some reason it's trying to treat all of them as cubes. And I'm thinking maybe it's the aliasing that I'm doing in the, in the in the shader. So I'm wondering if that is just breaking it, right? Uh, let's see. Redstone 4D. Hello, welcome to the stream. I am good, how about you? Posture check, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Uh, let me see the rendering, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I just actually broke the rendering. Unfortunately, that's what I'm trying to fix. Um, we did have it working like 10 minutes ago or so, I think. But uh, I'm trying to add IBL now, so it's kind of broken again. Um, but what I can do is if uh, if I can't fix this in the next couple minutes, I'll stash the changes and rebuild it so I can show you what it looks like. But... Um, yeah, so IBL is uh, image-based lighting. So... We've already got the basis of our PBR in. Um, we've got all our, our materials set up and things like that um, to work with a PBR uh, pipeline. But now we need IBL, which improves the overall lighting of the scene. It's it's basically for our ambient lighting um, to get a little bit more accurate ambient lighting. And that's what I'm putting in place now. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can get this to work real quick and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. So um, this is our PBR uh, shader that most of the work has been going into. And I'm just trying to figure out an issue with this right now, um, which is basically I'm trying to alias these two arrays, uh, but that doesn't seem to be working. So it's a little bit confusing. I wish I was this smart. I mean, it's not about being smart, right? It's about, it's about just sticking with it and learning things and taking the time to learn through those things, right? Um, The most techy thing I ever did was make a sand, a sand sim. Like sand in an hourglass, is that what you mean? You had to square up with some MFs and coffee stream the other day. I had to refer them to the stream. I don't, since I don't stream anymore. Fair enough. Um, it had water. It had water way better. So I mean, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different sets of tech, right? Like it's basically. T cap. <laughs> What's going on, man? T TCAP was there. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. How's it going? Good to see you, TCAP. C doesn't have generics. How do you do anything? <laughs> yeah, uh, I do a lot without it. Yeah. TCAP writes C anyways. Yep. I love C. C is my favorite. But yeah, um, Redstone. I mean... You know, the thing you have to keep in mind is all this stuff that I'm doing here is all learned, right? And there's still plenty of this stuff that makes me scratch my head on a daily basis, right? So that, like, it's not about being smart to be able to do this stuff. It's about just learning it, right? It's a learned it's a learned skill set just like anything else. Um, just ask any of these other guys that are, that are devs, like TCAP, for example. You know, he, he, he learned all this stuff too. He's doing some pretty cool stuff over on his channel. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just learned stuff. It's learned skills, right? I can't understand any of these fancy things. C, C sharp, CPP versus Java. Mostly because you hate semicolons and curly braces. Get used to them. You're much better in life with them than without them. I'm going to try this. And I think this is not going to work either, but I'm going to try it. Instead of aliasing these things, I'm going to try and treat them as separate arrays and see if it works. Um, let's see. 
So for this, let's see if that works or if it just blows up hideously again. You'd rather write binary? I mean, I hate to tell you, but most languages are, are that way. Yeah, it's blowing up hideously. So, let me see, at least see what the, the errors are. I think, I think I'm going to wind up having to do this a different way, because I don't think Vulcan likes the way that I'm trying to do it right now. It's still, I think... Yeah, it's still trying to resolve all these as cube maps. Even though I'm trying to alias it and tell it to not do that, it's still doing it. You can't read it? I mean, <laughs> it's not... You don't want to. I mean, yeah, that's that's a choice, right? I mean, I, I, I choose not to use uh, certain languages because of the way that they are, right? That's a lot of gigs on texture. Do you mean just like uh, all the all the textures that I'm loading for like each material? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Or do you mean... Do you mean that like this? Is that what you were referring to? I do have um, that's about what it, that's what I'm using in Vulcan right now the allocator tracking yeah yeah so um, most of this is CPU stuff right and this is like my whole my whole pool of memory right um, and so technically like my Vulcan stuff is it's both uh, the Vulcan GPU and CPU technically But yeah, it is. I mean, l like I said, though, I'm not doing I'm not doing any compression, and I'm not doing. Um, this is like wholly unoptimized, right? So um, I'm gonna reduce the map count for one thing, and that will like slice this in half, literally, or better. Oh the, oh, are you talking about the actual exception? Yeah, that's in that's in bytes. So, I mean it's I think if actually, let me see. Where did that come up? You're talking about this thing, right? Uh where is Is this what you're talking about? Like this thing that comes up? Is this a generic engine? Yes. Is it Vroman or Vroman? Vroman. The texture size part. Texture. I'm not sure. Not on the console and the log. Ah. Which part? I'm not sure which, uh... You're talking about all this crap? Line 180 or something? You're talking about this? Oh! Shit, I see what you mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, that ain't right. <laughs> That's a bug for sure. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, that's a... Uh, hmm. <laughs> that's sus. <laughs> I, think my, I think my calculation there might be a little bit off. That's a lot of gigabytes, yeah. Didn't I tell you I was running on a super powerful computer? 
that's hmm yeah <laughs> that's how much memory i have i don't even know how yeah okay i got nothing there i'll have to figure that out yeah that's definitely wrong it's pretty sweet though but yeah this is um so to answer your question tcap this is a generic engine for now um it's all going to be plug-in based so um at some point, like if you want FPS features, like that'll be an extension to the engine slash a plugin um, versus, I don't know, like a tile based engine would be a different set of plugins or something like that. Um, and so the core engine itself only contains like your basic systems, like your logging and your memory management and things like that. The GIMP event, oh, GIMP of engines. I don't know about that. But um, yeah, the whole idea is to be able to extend it and to be able to um, add plugins to it for the functionality that you need and have the application itself, the consuming application, be responsible for deciding um, what plugins to use and how those plugins should be configured. I hope that makes sense. Uh, okay. So the issue here is that I'm trying to jam in another sampler at the end of these of these samplers, right? So this is actually an array of six. But the last sampler is a sampler cube, not a sampler 2D. And it's like when I when I do this, which I was reading that you could do aliasing of uniforms like this, right? So if you set the same binding and set and just do this and then only ac access zero through four on this and then access five on this, right? If I do this, then that should work. But nothing I've done so far has actually had that be working. Um, which is super annoying, right? Like I've, I've literally tried to go samplers five and that doesn't work. It bleats about the same thing. It basically takes this and like redefines this as this, and it doesn't throw that as a compilation error. It just treats them all like this. And so I know there's gotta be a way to like mix them, but I'll be damned if I can figure out what it is. So I may have to go back to the drawing board as far as how I'm actually approaching this part of the problem. So um, to show you where I'm at, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stash this. And build. That way I can actually run this and show you guys what it looks like. <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah, should be good. All right, so this is actually what it's supposed to look like. Um, now we don't have IBL in here, which is why everything's so dark, right? So our ambient um, calculation is wrong, which is why all this stuff is so dark. It'll be a lot lighter once we actually can include, you know, essentially this skybox, which is what we're going to use um, as our IBL map um, in this, but we don't have that currently. So um, this is kind of what we have so far. Um, and like I can move this a little closer to the light so you can kind of see that a little bit better maybe rotate a little bit, right? And so we can see that um, all of our maps are actually working correctly. Um, and so our physically based lighting definitely is a lot more accurate than it was when we were using Fong, which was earlier tonight. Um, and so it's come a, a long ways, but we still have a long way to go, you know? Uh, let's see. I just got here. What's a PBR Pabs Blue Ribbon? <laughs> You know, I could go for one of those at the moment. Physically based rendering, yes. You've had that bug, seg, seg faults when you run the test bed. 
Yeah, so um, it'll seg fault if you're running, you're writing like lots of crap to the logs, uh, because what it's also generating under the hood is all of this logging stuff here. So um, we have a in-game console that we we made in our our uh, when we were writing our UI system, and so it's like generating all the geometry for all this crap um, under the hood too. Which technically it's only generating what you're seeing here, but once that gets past a certain point, it doesn't like it. Um, might help if I typed it right, but yeah. So uh, let me think. So if I do. Because the, pro the other problem is, like, you can't use that, right? Like, that doesn't work either. I've tried that. You have 120 coffees. That's awesome. I wonder if there's a way I can see how many coffees everybody has. I'm going to drink them all. I wouldn't drink them all at once. I'll take that hydrate though. <laughs> you died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you had 120 coffees, yeah, that would probably not be good for the heart, right? All right. Um If I do let me pop the uh let me pop this back out. Uh let's see. Oh, I see. The pop failed because I actually wrote a change. Just do get reset and then do this. If I do that, am I going to get the inverse? No overloaded phone. Hmm. Wait. Eighty six. Yeah, see, that should work. This line would be good if this was a cube sampler.
That's what's really annoying about this is like it doesn't let you it doesn't let you say like the first five are of one type and the last one is of another type. I don't even think I can do this, right? Like maybe I can do that. Set of, oh, I forgot to change. Change this back to cube samplers. Left the chat of left the chat of error too much coffee. Was res joined the chat? Was tasty though. Yeah, I mean it would be tasty. Wait, did it literally just poop itself again? 86. What did I miss here? Cubes. Oh. Still out of range because it's only an array of one. I don't know if that's going to work or not. Yeah, no, it's not going to work because I don't have a texture there. Well, that doesn't why is it seg faulting there on the fifth one that doesn't make any sense By instance, so what is my I wonder if that means it actually did work. Bound instance ID. All right, let's get rid of some of these things. And we'll do this. Um, texture maps, and we'll make this a array of six. Oh, did I? Might help to spell it right. There we go. That would explain it. Hmm. So why don't I have a map for that? Because I technically should. Sampler count is here. Apply instance. Is it because it's not configured? Oh, we have ads. When it seg faults for you, it seg faults in the Vulcan renderer.
Got about 40 seconds left. <laughs> you can't spend the 30 more. Nice. Ten seconds left. All right, we're back. Cool. So, um, so M. Paul Home was it seg faults for you when you're in the Vulcan renderer? Does it do that when you're full? If you full screen it. By chance? Is that why it's doing it? Because that is a known thing that's kind of bugging me for a while. It runs for a little bit and then it just poops itself. It's an issue I've got to figure out. You don't get a chance to. Really? So it just kind of happens and that's off the main branch? Crashes within a half second of opening up. What do you get in the, um, do you get any error messages in the console? Main branch from a couple days ago. Okay. That's very strange. Problem is, is I don't have like a wide variety of hardware to run it on, so that's going to be an interesting thing to test. <clears throat> All right. Um, let me stop this. So it can't assign that. It's not assigning that map, rather. Um, let's see, when we do this, PBR, Sign it to maps five. Hmm. Get the fault cube. So that should should do the thing. Let's trace this back up for a second. So maps five. Change this to PBR map count. Same with that. Map count is obtained from what? Material maps. Nope. Yes. Config maps. Oh. All right, that makes sense. This is the number of configured. rename that to be a little more explicit um, okay so that all makes sense I don't see anything else in here that I've missed something's obviously not getting that last map though So that's just getting the shader. Okay. 
PBR map count. So map count here is going to be six. So maps, map count maps. We're not using any hard coded stuff there. I saw your to do in job system C about sleeping. I think a semaphore does exactly what you want and they are very easy to use. Yes, I agree. It's probably a semaphore is the, the answer there as opposed to just sleeping. That was like a, it was one of those temporary but permanent hack fixes. Like, yeah, I'll come back to this. Mm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I get two open AL invalid operation errors. Yeah, that's not a big deal. That shouldn't cause a crash. And then a texture usage of, that's just a, an issue with the reporting. Um, so I don't think either of those things should cause it to crash. Yeah, it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a huge deal. But yeah, um, TCAP, I, I think uh, I think you're right about semaphores. That's that's probably exactly what I need. I just haven't set that up yet. Because of course, um, you know, setting others up on Windows versus Linux and Mac are a little bit different. So I have to make sure that they work exactly the same across the board. Because I've done it on Windows, but I haven't done that on Linux slash Mac. I think the pthread library's got something in there for it. And I just haven't haven't messed with it. So I've got to read up on that. But yeah, that's going to be much better than sleeping for sure. Uh, let's see. I really don't see any reason why this shouldn't be assigning what it should be. Even in the default material. Unless well, no, this is rendered with a different shader, so it shouldn't matter. Should I put the log in the Discord server? Yeah, um, toss it up in the... Um, the Kohi series channel and at me on it. So I see it that way. I, um, I can look at it, but yeah, that that'll work for now. Cause at least with the logs, I, I should be able to, um, to tell what's happening. Cause it, the open AL thing shouldn't, shouldn't be an issue. That should like never cause things to crash. I suspect there's probably something else. Okay. I must have fixed something because now we're kind of back where we were before. So here we go. Okay, it's bleating about the default cube view. And I'll bet this is a view type cube and dem mismatch it is. So 
So it still thinks, regardless of what I've done, that even though... I guess the aliasing just doesn't work. The interesting bit about this it worked for these five but this is the one it's failing on and saying the image view is correct unless this is trying to like pull from oh lol they have a typo in there Error reporting. That's three R's. R-raid. Must have been written by a pirate. That's pretty funny. Um, I wonder what would happen if I did this and then change this to five. I'll bet it still poops. Yeah. Didn't like it. Index 5. Yeah, mismatch. These are all just for that last one. Rude. So, let me see if I can find it. This is what led me to believe I could do this. Now, granted, they're dealing with dynamic arrays here, but I shouldn't have to do dynamic arrays. To my understanding this is valid to alias descriptor bindings. The problem is, is like, this isn't documented, right? So like, if I have an array of samplers, can I mix them this way? Can I alias them this way? That's the question. So it's valid so long as access between alias descriptors is exclusive in the given execution, which it is because I'm only accessing the first five on this one and the sixth one on this one. Exclusive means you can access text 2Ds, zero, and text cubes one during one execution, e.g. draw call, but not index zero, both, that makes sense. Execution is important here as both can be statically referenced, but as long as your shader logic ensures that only one is accessed in a dynamically uniform way, it should work fine. Dynamically uniform is important here because descriptors are bound at the command buffer level.
Just use the same set and binding number for the different sampler types in your shader. The descriptor type is the same anyways, exactly. The underlying descriptor type is the same anyways. So there's no reason to use just different descriptor sets. Right, that's exactly what I'm doing. I should be able to do this. Essentially. I personally just use a sampler separate from the textures. I think some GPUs significantly lower limits. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is an option, I suppose, if I want to change the entire way that works. I suppose I could do it that way. Really don't want to have to though. I don't understand why this doesn't work. The only other thing that I can think of The only other thing I can think of is maybe separating them all out somehow. I don't think that's going to do it though. Hmm. Pretty sure I can't do this. kind of accepted that. Did I not save this? Yeah, so that error is the same. What's this first one up here? Oh, it's just another draw. Okay. You know, I hate that when it gives you these error messages that you click on this link and it takes you to this page that takes forever to load and so the bookmark doesn't work. But I can search the page for that. Instruction sampler image view validation certain number of cases where Spur V can 
instruction can mismatch with the sampler image view or both. In such cases, the value of the text will returned is undefined. So this is a weird thing though, is like looking at the view before it crashes, it looks like it actually does work. Spur V instructions image variables properties are not compatible with the image view. So image 2D must have a dim of 2D arrayed zero. Cube has to have the dim of cube. Arrayed zero, MS zero. Hmm. Yeah, this makes sense. So I don't know if there's a way around this is the question. Sam, first time chat, welcome to the stream. Uh, hi, what's the name of your keyboard, please? So the keyboard I'm using is the Keychron K2. There it is. So this is the Keychron K2. I'll toss that in the, uh, actually, you know what? I'll do one better. I'll find a link to it and I'll put that in chat. Um, This is it here. Wow, that's a really, that's a lot of tracking crap. Okay. Um, let's see if I can paste it without all that tracking crap and see if that link works. It does. Okay. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the link to my keyboard there that I use. I don't remember if I actually got it on Amazon or not, but yeah, it's pretty pretty solid keyboard. Um, I will paste this over here for you YouTube guys as well. This is the link to the keyboard that I use. Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay. So... All this tells me that these have to match, but it doesn't mention anything about aliasing. Maybe I should search the document for aliasing. Oh God. That's a lot of matches. <laughs> um. sparse resource features. I don't think that's going to be what I'm looking for. Acceleration structures. I don't think that's going to be what I'm looking for either. Okay, I figured figured this would be in here somewhere. 
dedicated allocation image aliasing. No, I don't think that's what I'm going to want. Anti-aliasing. I think this is all extension stuff, so I can skip past a lot of this. Memory aliasing. Image layout transitions, that's not what I need. Subpass. This is all subpass stuff, I don't need that. Dedicated allocation image aliasing. That's not it. This would be such a stupidly easy thing to do on OpenGL. Detains, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate that. Welcome. How are you doing? How can I learn C++? Use it. Um, follow some language tutorials uh, on online uh, about the language. Read the, uh, the language spec at some point. Um, don't expect to take it all in at once. Um, but read the language spec. Uh, you can Google for where to find that. And then just start using the language, right? Start programming things in it. And as you program things in it, just Google, you know, how do I do this in C++? How do I do this in C++? Um, but the key to it is to just keep using it. Um, keep following tutorials, but also read up on, you know, maybe maybe grab a book on, on uh, learning it. I usually suggest that people learn C first and then move to C++ because there's a lot of... Uh, concepts that uh, C++ carries over from C that are very useful to understand before you jump into all of C++. Um, so normally I say that people should always learn C first and then jump into C++ because C++ is a very uh, large convoluted feature creep language with tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of features. Um, but yeah, that's basically my answer there. Um, For C, uh, this is a decent book. Um, it's uh, Sam's Teach Yourself C in 24 Hours, I think it is. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's a decent book. Um, let's see, do I even have... For C++, um, Effective C++ is another good one. Uh, also... There's a decent primer to C++ and computer science in general in um, Game Engine Architecture by Jason Gregory. Um, that's another book, a good book. So, yeah, I would recommend read some books for sure. Uh, we have ads. So if you can still hear me, um, I'd like to to uh, pause the stream whenever we have uh, ads come up on uh, on Twitch. Um, YouTube doesn't always necessarily get them at the same uh, the same time, but um, I like to do that because uh, that way you guys don't miss any content, right? So um, you know, ad breaks are never longer than say two minutes, so I like to just pause the stream and. Uh, you know, wait for the, the minute and a half to two minutes to go by. Um, and we're already down to 45 seconds. So um, in another little bit, we'll be get going here and, and continue.
All right, uh, we got about 20 seconds remaining. All right, and we are back. So thank you guys for uh, sticking with me through that. Um, ads are dead now, so uh, we can continue. Uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm just kind of looking through the uh, the Vulcan spec and seeing if they have anything in here about uh, aliasing uh, when it comes to uh, GLSL uniforms, right? Um, specifically when it comes to Spur-V. It looks like we've looped all the way back around, though. So, I know this is this is about bindless textures, so I don't know if maybe you have to be doing bindless textures in order to actually use this. Um, So this is about dynamic arrays of combined image sampler, and I don't necessarily need dynamic arrays. I suppose we could look up that extension, right? Device extension, okay. Okay, there are, this is all about indexing, okay. Non-uniform indexing, the shader requires the use of a new decoration. Their descriptor set layout binding creation flag. Okay, this might be what I'm looking for. Update it after they are bound. Okay. That's update after bind, so that's nothing. Relax the requirement that all descriptors in a binding that is statically the used. requirements that are binding are those that use the word. <laughs> which means Alexa, that stop. That's hilarious. Apparently, I have to mute my Alexa. Somehow. It caught what I was saying. That's hilarious. Uh, let's see. In, uh, in your PBR shaders, you're calculating the bitangent. I know that sometimes you have to flip the bitangent to align normals to the map properly. Are you flipping outside the shaders? Yeah, so um, I actually do that when I'm reading in the, uh, the geometry. If um, I do a little bit of calculation there when I'm reading that in and, and validating all of that. Um, and then I've got a W component that flips it, uh, that I use to, to flip it back and forth if need be. Um, and I just pass that right in. So yes, it's determined outside the shader. And it's actually, um, it's stored in the geometry information itself. Uh, let's see. The final binding in the descriptor set layout can have a variable size. I don't really need that. So this is kind of nice, um, but I don't think it's going to get me necessarily what I need. It's valid for multi multiple descriptor arrays in a shader to use the same set and binding number, as long as they are all compatible with the... Oh. This means a single array binding in the descriptor set can serve multiple texture dimensionalities. 
or an array of buffer descriptors can be used with multiple different block layouts. So maybe that right there is actually what I need. Do I have to call anything to enable that though? Update after bind, I don't need that. Okay, so I wonder if... I wonder if there's anything that I have to do to turn that on. Variable descriptor count. No, I don't need that. Boy, there's a lot of requirements around this. All right, I don't think this is what I need. Indexing features, indexing properties. Let's try this. Oh, geez. These are all, okay, these are all indexing. Update after bind, update after bind. Partially bound. Runtime descriptor array. I wonder what that one is. Runtime arrays. What the heck does that even mean? Runtime descriptor array capability. Hmm. See, folks, this is the non fun part of. <laughs> engine dev is sometimes you have to dig, dig deep into docs like this in order to actually find an answer. I feel like I'm getting close, but... Okay, this is all update after bind stuff. Update after bind. non-uniform indexing. I don't think this is going to have anything I need in it. I wonder if just having this extension active would be enough. Provides API support for non-uniform qualifier. What is this? Runtime size arrays.
So I wonder if maybe this is what I need. Could you do a lot more parallel stuff in Vulkan than OpenGL? Absolutely, yes. Like single draw calls versus many. So you could multi-thread draw calls, but it doesn't always make sense to. Like if you're drawing to the same target, then you can't really do that, right? But if you're drawing to multiple targets, you could split those off and do those on, a, on different threads. Um, as long as that you're sure to actually synchronize that stuff and have it all come together at the end and join those threads back together so that the order of operations remains what you need it to be, then yeah. Are there VAO, VBO concepts in OpenGL? Do you mean in Vulkan? Because yes, uh, I mean, more or less, but they're not really... Like, those things are kind of abstract ideas that OpenGL gives you, right? Like, like VBOs, VBOs definitely exist. Um, VAOs are kind of a state thing that OpenGL has that Vulkan, you have to kind of build that stuff on your own. So, I mean, yes, a lot of those concepts exist, but they're very, very different in Vulkan. Um, OpenGL kind of automates how a lot of that stuff works, whereas Vulkan, you have to define all that stuff. I hope that makes sense. Um... Okay. Well, I think... Let me just try turning on the extension real quick. Uh, where was that? I think it was in here. Portability. We do have active already dynamic indexing. So, which one was that? Was that right here I wonder if behavior.
Is it literally just a one? I'm not sure that this is what I'm going to need. Because again, this seems focused around. So let me redeclare it. Okay, you can't redeclare size, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not thinking that's actually gonna be what I want. Let's see. Maybe this is though. Uh, implementing normal mapping in my own renders, having issues, so I'm looking for explanations. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, have a have a look at uh, the way that I'm I'm handling it, specifically where I'm going through and generating the by tangents. I think it's in geometry details. I think. Yeah, right here. This handedness right there. That's probably what you're looking for. All right, let me catch up on chat here. Um, have you tried out metal? Not yet. Uh, I plan to though, because I have a Mac, uh, and I am going to write a uh, a back end for that. Smudge, hello, welcome. You know it's a good stream when you're deep in Vulcan docs. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh I'm running into kind of a stupid issue, to be completely honest. Um, although I guess most Vulcan issues Vulcan issues are stupid issues, right? Um. So, basically, I need the ability to, mm, wait a minute, uh, fragment, so basically I have um, a texture, right, oops. Put those back. Basically, I have um, two texture arrays, right? And right, I should say I have one texture array, and I'm trying to alias this as a second type, right? So indices zero through four, I want to use as sampler 2Ds, and index five, I want to use as a sampler cube. And that's not working. Um, when I declare this, it's basically remapping all of these to this type, and that's not working. So it's really annoying. Um, and I know there's a way to do it. I just have to figure out 
how to actually do it. But yeah, that's kind of where, kind of where I'm at. Uh, let's see. So that's kind of why I'm uh, I'm poking through the the old Vulcan docks, right? So I'm thinking descriptor indexing. <laughs> Johnny Waffles, I'm here to party. Well, welcome uh, to the stream, first time chat. Welcome, welcome. I am a uh, probably going to be wrapping up here in a bit just because uh i've been at this for a while and we've made some really good progress tonight we do have um we do have the basic aspects of a pbr renderer in place uh we've updated our materials we do have rendering working um, now i'm trying to implement ibl and uh i got stuck on a stupid technical difficulty with Vulcan but you have a question yes what is the question What is my opinion on Bigfoot? <laughs> That's so extremely random. What is my opinion on Bigfoot? I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I have Sasquatch hands sometimes, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have one, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure Bigfoot exists, you know, but... It's probably not just one Bigfoot, it's probably a colony of Bigfoot, Big Feet. I think it's just a really, uh, really tall dude with large feet. But yes, I guess that would be my take on it. That's probably the most random question I've gotten in quite some time. He's a liar and can't be trusted. Don't vote for Bigfoot in the next election. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You meant the monster truck? That's awesome. He was in another chat asking the same question. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty random now. It's random to me anyways, I guess. Non-uniform qualifier. Isn't that... Yeah, that's this. Okay. So I don't think that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, this is the part that escapes me because it's literally saying right here what I'm looking for, but. Oh, that's the same page I was just on.
must be present in the module. Where's a usage example of this? Non-uniform qualifier. Okay. Again, I don't need the dynamic size aspect of it. Using a variable index. This is literally what I'm supposed to do. That doesn't seem right. These are questions that need answered. I mean, that's fair enough. That is fair enough. Uh, okay, I guess I'll try this. I don't think this is gonna be what I'm looking for, but. Uh, how did that? What was the syntax of that guy again? So it's literally like this. I don't think this is gonna work, but let's try it. Nope, that's a big nope. So this is saying this must be present in the module. Is that literally just asking me to just put this in here? Like at the top? That doesn't seem right to me, but... Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay, so I just looked at the clock and realized how late it is. I'm like way over. <laughs> 
So um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to wrap this up for tonight. Um, I am going to push up the branch that we have so far, the, the uh, committed stuff. Uh, I think I already did, actually. That's telling me I already did. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, that code is already pushed. Uh, that's a working version of PBR so far. And then we'll figure out this IBL stuff, uh, I guess, tomorrow, right? Um, so I've got to figure out um, how to get this stuff to work. So, um, but anyways, yeah, uh, that is going to pretty much do it for me tonight. Uh, I'm going to drop my social links here um, and uh, Twitch chat. And then um, on the YouTube side, uh, thank you guys uh, for following here as well. Um, if you haven't already, feel free to uh, toss a subscribe there on the YouTube side, um, just so that you guys don't miss uh, the next stream when it comes up. And over here on the Twitch side, if you guys uh, wouldn't mind tossing me a follow, that helps me out a lot. Um, helps me grow the channel and whatnot. So uh, this is supposed to be sort of an educational resource um, to help people uh, understand everything that goes into building an engine and whatnot. Um, and it's kind of the resource I wish I had when I was learning to do all this stuff. So um, if you guys like the cause and whatnot, feel free to, um, you know, follow me in all the places. I would greatly appreciate it. But yeah, um, I'm going to... Let's see, and look for somebody to raid. Um... Let's see. Let me find a channel here. Hmm. see. I think for tonight, since uh, we've been kind of, this is a really long stream and I'm really tired, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and raid Ferret Software. So this is a ferret rescue um, where uh, they take in uh, ferrets that are uh, basically in near-death scenarios um, and rehabilitate them, give them a good life, and give them a permanent good home uh, to live in. And so uh, I think that's a really great cause, and I'm all for it. Um, and uh, it's run by Pirate Software, who's another uh, very popular game dev here um, on Twitch. And I think it's a really great cause. And just uh, having the stream up playing without throwing bits or anything like that uh, is uh, enough from the ad revenue alone to pay for all the care uh, and medical care, food, supplies, all that stuff for the ferrets. So I think it's really great. And uh, I want to go ahead and support that. So I'm going to go ahead and end this tonight. Uh, it's been a long stream. Thank you guys for being here so much, and I appreciate it. And I will see you guys. Uh, see you guys in the next one.